Hello everyone, welcome to Communication Society Co-Conference Day 2. Our, our first session today is uh, Agile Mindset. Uh, Suha Selçuk from Ed Training for Agile will be talking about Agile Mindset. Mindset. Mr. Selçuk, wel welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure for me to uh, be here. Thank you. Uh, you can start your presentation now. Okay. Uh, thank you. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you to, to the organizers uh, to having me here within this slot and also uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, hope you will enjoy the next 25 minutes with me and uh, maybe uh, I guess it will be uh, inspiring. Uh, let's start uh, with introducing uh, myself shortly. Uh, my name is Suha Sarchuk and I live in Istanbul. Uh, have a total work experience nearly to uh, 15 years. Uh, today I will talk about Agile and uh, let me briefly inform you about my Agile background. Uh, I, uh, I first met Agile while I was working in Sony in 2009 and since then uh, Agile has been an important part of my life uh, and uh, while working at my last uh, uh, job uh, I decided to quit my job uh, at IBM uh, four years ago and uh, founded T4A in January uh, 2017. Uh, within the last four years, uh, I gave trainings, uh, consultancy uh, within this, uh, within Turkey and uh, I consulted to the biggest uh, Agile transformations in Turkey and also uh, founded a non-profit organization called uh, Open Agile Turkey. Uh, with Open Agile Turkey, we have organized two conferences and uh, approximately uh, 500 people attended to that conferences and we organized more than uh, 50 meetups. So I am a registered education pro provider of Scrum Alliance and I regularly give public speech. Uh, I have a book, uh, book as you see uh, within the presentation. Uh, the, the book is in Turkish. I wrote it in Turkish. Uh, its name is Failure Stories, and it's a kind of retrospective of agile transformations, uh, my personal journey. Uh, and at the end of the book, there is a, a section that gives tips about uh, uh, for effective agile transformations. Uh, today, I will try to explain the core ideas, essential ideas of Agile and uh, how you can concentrate uh, on these essential ideas and the key differences between the traditional management and the Agile approach and uh, how they are different, how they differ and uh, how these core ideas and differences can be applied not only in the business field um, but also in, in the individual lives. So uh, I believe that these ideas, these core agile ideas are the essentials on approach and mindset. That's why uh, th that can affect your entire life, life and that can affect how you decide, how you act, how you behave, um, how you think also. Uh, that's why uh, did, did, uh, I want you, I want all of you to take this session as a kind of mindset to be applied in uh, your daily life. So the uh, first, uh, the, the, the, the main purpose of the Agile is uh, creating value. So. Uh, the first of these ideas uh, about is value. So, uh, Agile is about creating value and agile, the overall purpose of Agile is increasing the value. So, uh, we need to define value in order to understand this first uh, idea. Uh, even if you work in a company 
or uh, in your daily life, uh, create, we, we, uh, when we talk about creating value or when we talk about value, we are emphasizing the net benefit that is created for your purpose or for or for your company's purpose. So uh, for achieving this overall uh, goal uh, for the companies or for your life, uh, uh, if you create benefits, net benefit, you this means you create value. And Agile is about creating value. So uh, our main aim within the Agile processes is uh, increasing the value. So if you do not create value, uh, I simply can say that you are not agile. So uh, it applies to any group, by the way. Uh, a common uh, group of people uh, have a, a shared goal or shared understanding. So it applies to them. And uh, like nonprofit organizations, like companies, like state agencies, and like uh, personal lives, or um, sport teams, uh, uh, etc. So uh, all of them uh, can become agile or increase the agility in themselves. So the main criteria uh, uh, to look at that group of people, if they are agile or not, is the first criteria is uh, about value. So. Uh, uh, Agile come, uh, came to our lives uh, at the early stage of the uh, 2000s. So uh, after that, while Agile has been increasing its popularity uh, uh, uh, all over the world, uh, at, for the last 20 years, we, we generally see that uh, Agile has become, uh, especially within the, the last three years, Agile has become the main stream of uh, business world. So uh, still uh, we have uh, seen that uh, there are lots of misunderstanding about Agile. So uh, that's why uh, I want to briefly explain uh, this misunderstanding because uh, if you don't understand these uh, values and principles and if you don't understand the agile correctly uh, this will result uh, uh, as a misimplementation or the wrong implementation so uh, then this will damage the agile so uh, uh, people tend to see Agile uh, as a silver bullet, or agile as a destination, or the the goal itself is not agile. So uh, they they think that agile is a kind of a rescue methodology, or uh, is a final destination, and uh, they believe that one day they will become agile, and then everything will be fine, everything will be uh, solved. So that's not the case, and none of uh, these assumptions are correct. So, uh, contrarily, Agile is a journey. Agile is a journey of discovering uh, and continuous improvement. Uh, what we discovered, uh, how can we improve? Uh, how can uh, we make better products? We can. How can we create uh, better products or anything else that will create in? Uh, that will increase the value that we created will be discovered within this uh, period or within this agile uh, uh, discovery journey. So uh, we need to correctly understand the basics of agile to increase the value. Agile is the flexibility and agile is the ability uh, to respond to change in order to create value. So uh, agile is focusing on uh, creating a culture uh, that is continuously improving and agile is focusing on uh, value and agile is trying to uh, agile is about trying to increase the value that uh, uh, also try to find new ways to increase the value the, uh, that's why uh, becoming agile is not the uh, uh, main goal. 
The, the main goal is creating uh, value. Agile is the way that we can increase uh, the value created uh, during these processes. Uh, Agile can only be expressed as a skill or approach. Uh, uh, in other words, uh, uh, it can be expressed as a culture that can be uh, obtained through uh, only experience or practice. So, Agile is an umbrella. Uh, uh, uh, it is the sum of uh, some values and principles. And these values and uh, principles based on some uh, values that are emphasized uh, within the Agile Manifesto. So, let us look at uh, the picture a, a little bit in deeper. So, according to the Darwin's uh, origin of the species, uh, it is not the most intellectual species that are uh, survived, that survived. Uh, it is not the strongest one also they, uh, that they survived. Uh, the species who can adapt to change are still alive. Uh, that's why they, they survived. Uh, and agile is about being adaptive, not predictive. Because Agile uh, try to increase the uh, uh, ability to adapt to change, uh, to increase the value. That's why if you have a predictive uh, approach, that means uh, you can just, you, you want to just follow a plan, long-term plan. But uh, the result of following a long-term plan is uh, reducing the competitive ab ab advantage of uh, increasing value through uh, the adaptation of to the change. That's why the important, the first important thing, if we want to talk about agility, is being adaptive. So let's go to you. The second one is people. Uh, why uh, agile is focusing on people? Because uh, it's all about people. Uh, the, the traditional methods, uh, uh, traditional methods uh, evaluates the people as a resource. Uh, they just treat people as a resource and uh, that, that is not the way that agile works because if you want to increase agility, we have to trust people, we have to give some area people to being self-organized or to self-managed. So if you want uh, to increase the autonomy in a company or within a group, so if you have to trust people and empower them. And uh, first of all, you have to accept that people are not resources, they are values. They are a kind of values uh, for the companies or for the groups, for the teams. That's why uh, uh, people are more important uh, than the processes uh, according to the agile approach. If you increase the motivation, if, if you increase the happiness of the people, you increase the uh, productivity of that uh, uh, team or company. So the next one is about uh, working product rather than uh, documentation. Uh, agile is outcome oriented. Uh, output and outcomes are different things. Uh, uh, we have to define first of all uh, what is outcome uh, and what is output. The uh, outcome, uh, uh, the, uh, the outcome is the result that we want to achieve through the uh, business. Uh, I mean, outcomes are what the business wants or what they need to achieve. Uh, uh, the consequence of doing something is outcome. And the uh, output are the actions uh, to create that output. Uh, for example, uh, let me give an example uh, uh, to explain this better. Uh, think about that you are making a meal and uh, the output uh, about that meal is food, just food. 
Uh, however, the outcome is having a good uh, taste or good experience uh, or learning a new culture or uh, eating something new or uh, a good experience. That's just, uh, it's more than having a food. That's why uh, outcome and uh, output are different things. Output just measures uh, how much stuff we created. They are producing. It is about quality. Outcome, uh, on the other hand, measure, measures the value that is delivered. That's why uh, uh, if you want to increase the value, uh, we have to be the output oriented, uh, uh, outcome oriented. Uh, that's why working product is uh, more important than the uh, stuff that we did before creating the product. I mean, uh, also out, uh, output. So, uh, the next one it, uh, is about the growth mindset and the difference between the fixed mindset. The, the, the fixed mindset... Uh, uh, uh, the, the people who have the fixed mindset, mindset is uh, uh, constrained by their beliefs or their thoughts. They believe that uh, they, uh, uh, the failure is inevitable for them and uh, there's a, a limit uh, for uh, the ability of doing something for them or their uh, lack of intelligence or their lack of Anything limited abilities uh, will prevent them uh, from achieving their goals. So they give up easily, and uh, they fear of they have a feel constant fe uh, fear of uh, uh, being uh, uh, unsuccessful or be, uh, to fail. So uh, the belief they cannot improve. Uh, is the main idea of the fi uh, people who has a fixed mindset. On the other hand, uh, a person with a growth mindset uh, finds freedom uh, and uh, she believes that uh, she understands that certain people have special talents yet, but uh, she can do something uh, uh, uh, and she can continuously improve and also uh, she, uh, she can develop and increase the effort and their hard work. So uh, there's, there are opportunities. She knows that and she can uh, promote uh, or she can uh, understand these opportunities and uh, continuously improve. So uh, Agile is having uh, the growth mindset because uh, the Agile philosophy includes the Kaizen uh, approach, uh, which means continuous improvement. So if a company, if a team or an individual wants to have a, a culture that continues to improve, uh, we need to have a growth mindset. So uh, the next one is about uh, being empirical rather than being static. Uh, and critical process means uh, you have to inspect and adapt and uh, put in to, into a full feedback uh, loop to uh, incre uh, improve, it, to improve your processes, to learn something new. And critical process control or empiricism or empirical approach, whatever you say, it's not important. Uh, it relies on frequent inspection and continuous adaptation to minimize the risk, to maximize learning, and uh, to increase the quality of what you produce and to, uh, to uh, create outcome. That's why uh, and precision means trying something, experiencing, experiencing something, and learning from it. So learning from experiences is the main idea behind the empirical uh, philosophy. So uh, if you have an empirical process, you have to try something, inspect it, and continuously adapt. Uh, let me give an example about this. I know that I have uh, just four minutes, so let me sum up. Uh, uh, 
think about making a tea, okay, or making a coffee. Uh, this is a defined process. This is a static process. Why? Because you know uh, how to make a simple coffee. That's why uh, uh, this process contains no unknowns or can predict everything. The uncertainty is very low uh, about making a coffee. Uh, however, if you bought a new machine, new washing machine, and if you will... Uh, use it for the first time. So you have a different type of process here. This is empirical. You have to try something because it contains uh, unknowns uh, and you have to learn something. You have to try something, experience something, and then you have to learn which button does what. You have to learn it. You have to try or you read it. That's an empirical process. And agile is about being empirical, not static. Because uh, un un uh, human is unpredictable, uh, the life is unpredictable, and uh, today's world is uh, really unpredictable. We are experiencing what uncertainty means since the pandemic begins. So uh, uh, having an uncertainty or un uh, uh, uh, unpredictable uh, system means complexity then the world, today's world is a uh, complex world. And within the uncertainties, if you apply static processes, it is uh, quite dangerous. Uh, for example, you may burn your new machine, washing machine if you uh, apply a static process, if you think that you know everything about your new machine. So, uh, and the last uh, idea, the last uh, principle idea of Agile for me is self-management. So uh, the classical uh, management systems is based on command and control. Uh, they restrict hierarchies within a company and the applied command and control system try to um, make progress uh, during this traditional uh, management era. And uh, if you think about Agile, Agile is uh, people-centric, Agile is about creating value, Agile tries to increase the autonomy, and uh, if you try to uh, apply uh, Agile philosophy in your daily life or uh, in your company, you have to increase the self uh, organization and self-management uh, ability of the teams. Because uh, if you try to uh, uh, uh, make progress with command and control uh, instead, that that will lead a traditional and uh, uh, result that is not uh, value being value oriented. Uh, you cannot increase the creating uh, the value created in the organization with command and control culture. So uh, I think uh, my time is up, but uh, I can have your questions. If you have any questions, I would like to uh, hear them and answer. Please uh, feel free to ask anything about Agile or anything about my presentation. Thank you for your presentation. There are some questions on chat. Uh, ah. First question is from Mertcan. Can you explain the relationship between Agile and robotic process automation? Uh, robotic process automation does uh, increases the automation autonomy or uh, uh, increases the yes autonomy for uh, any system uh, we, we do the same thing for the organizations or for the uh, teams so we want to increase the autonomy uh, of the team why because uh, we want them uh, uh, to have the ability and flexibility to have to ha decide they uh, about their own plan to make their own plan and to adjust them accordingly in order to create value. That's why uh, 
uh, having an autonomy uh, within an organization is similar to uh, increasing the autonomy uh, systems uh, within any system. Thank you. Uh, second question is, how can we use Agile in student life? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is about mindset. It is about bring, uh, acting empirically. Uh, it, it is about increasing uh, the net benefit that you created within day, your daily life uh, in order to achieve your goals at the end of your journey. That, that's why uh, that's a mindset that will uh, change your behavior, the way you think, the way you study, etc. Uh, try to just try to uh, have this approach and try to think like uh, I mentioned within this presentation. Thank you for answers. This was all questions. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Hope uh, have, have a good time. Uh, thank you. Good evening. <laughs> good evening. Uh, we will have a short break now. See you in our second session.
Hello everyone, uh, it's me again. Now uh, our next session is about to start. Uh, we are going to chat about uh, 6G with Mr. Gül and uh, Mr. Aluini. Uh, now uh, I want to invite them to the stage. Uh, Mr. Gül, uh, could you come here? Of course. Hello, Mr. Gül. Uh, could you introduce yourself to our uh, audience? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm MM Vehicle IT Turkey YP Chair, and today uh, I will uh, moderate the webinar with uh, Deniz Kaya. And today we will have a very exciting uh, webinar uh, with Professor Mohamed Slim Alouini. Thank you. And uh, Sir Mohamed Slim Alouini, also, could you come here too? Okay, that's well. And uh, could you introduce yourself to our audience? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Deniz. Thank you, Omar, for the invitation. Uh, my name is Mohamed Simadwini. I am a professor of uh, electrical and computer engineering at uh, KAUST um, in uh, Saudi Arabia. We are one hour, uh, uh, you know, one hour uh, drive north of uh, the, uh, you know, the city of Jeddah. You probably all heard of the city of Jeddah. And, uh, you know, I, I work in the area of uh, wireless communication. And today I'm, uh, I'm honored to be part of this uh, webinar. Um, and I guess uh, the theme is uh, going to be beyond 5G and 6G networks. Yeah, exactly the same. Uh, and uh, if you are okay, uh, and uh, I want to uh, start our session with prepared questions. Uh, Mr. Gül, uh, do you want to say something? Yeah, uh, we, we are very glad to be are really uh, honored to uh, host you, uh, uh, such a great professor. Uh, professor Alouini, uh, and uh, let me add that uh, Professor Alouini is uh, a very humble professor, and he has already uh, published uh, more than 1,700 publications, and uh, his work uh, has uh, have already been cited uh, more than uh, 56,000 uh, times. So uh, today we have uh, such a well-known, such a worldwide known guest. Uh, so we are very glad to, and we are very. Uh, honor to uh, guess you, Professor. Thank you. Yeah, okay. we, I I think also the same thing. We are really lucky mm -hmm. and our and audience. One, one thing more. Uh, today we will start first uh, with 5G because uh, we are talking about uh, 5G. But uh, people, the academicians have, uh, have already uh, started to work on 5G. Um, for, for them one decade. Uh, they start in uh, 2009 on 5G, uh, but uh, the academicians start to work on the uh, 6G uh, one year ago in some countries and two years ago in Finland. And today we will not only talk on 5G, we will also uh, talk on 6G. And uh, Denise will start with the questions related to 5G. Thank you very much, Denise. You can continue. Okay, thank you. And uh, I want to start with uh, my first question. Recently, there has been a debate about whether 5G is harmful to human health or not. What do you think? Okay, thanks, Denise. Uh, so, so j just to start uh, on this topic that has been quite controversial over the last few months, uh, as you probably have seen in the general media. So my feeling is that based on all what has been published so far, and ourselves, we wrote a survey paper that was uh, made available on archive, uh, you know, a few months ago, and uh, still going through the review process. Our feeling is that, uh, you know, there is no compelling motivation, let's say, to stop the deployment of 5G uh, uh, networks because of uh, health region, as long as uh, the regulation that is in place is applied. The regulation is quite strict. It's where uh, every country has its own set of regulation about. Uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation and typically it's you it's kind of applied very strictly everywhere now, as long as this regulation is applied i don't think we have to worry much uh, about uh, let's say uh, emf uh, electromagnetic uh, field uh, radiations mm -hmm. uh, now on the other hand uh, most of the studies uh, my, my feeling has been done on the thermal effect of emf radiation so this so-called uh, uh, ionized non-ionized kind of uh, issues and uh, uh, uh, in the part of the spectrum where we are operating, we are operating essentially, you know, in, in the lower part of the RF spectrum, even the envisioned, let's say, uh, millimeter wave, 
in, in 5G uh, and even terahertz that people are talking about the 6G are still in the non-ionized part of the RF spectrum, which means that uh, there is not enough energy, let's say, to, to break uh, uh, uh, molecules or to kind of affect our DNA. So that aspect, I think, is seems to be very well studied and, and very well regulated. However, uh, probably uh, as part of beyond 5G, as part of 6G effort, there should be, let's say, uh, uh, a continued uh, uh, research effort on the possible health effect associated with, let's say, uh, uh, some realistic exposure level um, uh, that can lead maybe to some uh, uh, other biological mechanism um, that can eventually lead to, you know, bad disease like cancer or cardiovascular. So I think from the biomedical side, there is a need to do some more research on beyond terminal effects and see how they affect uh, uh, human health. Now, that's one side. On the other side, when you talk here about ourselves, like the telecom and the wireless communication engineering community, I need uh, uh, to emphasize that uh, probably we need to expand research efforts uh, from, let's say, even the device, the architectural, the network uh, perspective, so that essentially we can design more, let's call them, EMF-aware uh, networks. Networks that can deliver the required quality of service, but that minimize EMF radiation, especially in undesired places or in places where basically we need to have uh, minimum or no EMF radiation at all. So these, uh, so to, to kind of uh, sum it up, I think what we have now is, is safe. Nothing is kind of uh, alarming and definitely there is no need to go uh, and justify all these arson attack that happened uh, in the spring in the UK, Ireland, and we have heard about all these base stations being, being burned out. I, I don't think there is a really justification, especially at a time where we need connectivity uh, everywhere in this pandemic uh, uh, situation. So that's number one. Number two, uh, we need to do more research efforts in both the biomedical side to co continue investigating this issue and on the uh, telecom engineering side to design uh, more EMF aware, EMF friendly, let's say, wireless network. Okay, thank you for your answer. Uh, and I, I want to continue with my second question. Um, sorry. Okay, uh, with the introduction of 5G in our lives, there will be certain changes in IoT. Can you tell us about the development in this direction? No, I mean, IoT, uh, or let's say massive IoT, uh, has been one of the uh, main kind of promise of 5G, right? Like 5G is built on this three user scenario. One of them is uh, massive machine type communication or massive IoT. Uh, and, and the vision there was to kind of have this one connect device per meter square or equivalently one million connect device per kilometer square. It seems to me that technically this has been achieved. There has been tons of research on this, some prototyping, some deployment. I think we can do that. Uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, the key point, I guess, is, is there appetite for this uh, in the real uh, industry? Uh, do we really need this kind of one device connect per meter square? Uh, I'm, I'm not kind of very familiar with the business development, but uh, I think maybe it's still that he, we are in a situation where basically maybe the technology is a little bit ahead of the demand. Uh, but I think technically, it seems to me that uh, this is feasible. The IoT kind of research direction uh, has been kind of uh, very fruitful and people were able to deliver on expectation. But uh, are we seeing that massively deployed everywhere in our homes, everywhere in the uh, in industries? Maybe there are some niche where this is being exploded, but it's not widespread uh, as one you know, maybe would have expected uh, initially. But, you know, 5G time is still, uh, we have still 10 years of 5G, so maybe we'll see this deployment. And also, I would say the IoT aspect that start emerging, at least in also in academia in in research, is this beyond classical uh, uh, IoT in urban uh, smart city, uh, let's say uh, uh, uh, smart factory or industrial IoT kind of application, and people start talking about this concept that I like to call X IoT. So this underwater IoT is a space IoT, the underground IoT, the health IoT. So these other other niche where people felt that actually uh, connecting devices in, in some kind of environments and, 
and uh, among themselves and eventually to the internet backbone can smartify, let's say, many of these environments. So there is this tendency to to IoTify, like some people call that, uh, many environment, and that's another interesting direction that is also picking up nicely. Uh, and there is quite a bit of interesting work in again in IoT in in rural areas for smart farming, in underwater for underwater exploration uh, and monitoring, and and so on and and so forth. Thank you for your answer. Uh, now uh, I am going to ask my last question. Uh, it's going to be a long question, so uh, I'm going to read it slowly. The low wavelength and high frequency waves are greatly affected by environmental factors. The 5G wave emanating, emanating from a remote base station may be distorted until it reaches the receiving device. Will the station be installed everywhere to prevent it, or what kind of solution do you think will be brought? Okay, you know, this is, of course, a, a problem that has been envisioned as part of 5G. 5G is the first kind of uh, generation of wireless communication system that is kind of adventuring and getting into the millimeter uh, range. Uh, as, as we'll talk more and more about 6G, uh, people are actually uh, envisioning also to use uh, the terahertz band even beyond the uh, millimeter uh, which means we are indeed going to this very low wavelength to these high frequencies i mean you can push this even further and uh, you start talking about optical wireless communication like li-fi and, and and free space optics so of course uh, uh, the higher you go in frequency uh, the the higher is the path loss and the, the more limited is your range uh, and uh, you need to find the solution to basically mitigate this. I mean, it has some advantage because you can reuse the spectrum uh, more um, uh, more efficiently. It comes at the cost because this densification of the network. So, which means that essentially, I'm not here exposing the first solution. The first solution is densify. Basically, have many many more access points, and every access point will have a small range but a very high capacity, uh, basically uh, uh, coverage area. Let's say, and then. Uh, you, you can reuse the spectrum and you can uh, overall uh, basically have a very high area uh, spectral efficiency. But this comes at the expense at basically it's uh, at, at, an ex at a cost, uh, which is like all this base station that we deploy everywhere is it, not cheap. And uh, this probably is worth it or is uh, makes sense only in dense urban environment where there is demand and there is basically a lot of users who can subscribe and can basically uh, allow these MNOs to get their return on investment. So densification is one solution. Uh, another solution that uh, basically, uh, uh, uh, you know, people are envisioning is this kind of uh, uh, assistant uh, uh, by UAVs. Uh, you know, when you have a big, also when you get into these uh, uh, very uh, low wavelength, very high frequencies, uh, and you get also um, very much narrow beams and you get essentially restricting yourself only to line of sight kind of communication. If you are in a dense environment with a lot of obstacles, essentially you end up being always, uh, not always, I mean, often, let's say, in in these kind of not spots or area where you don't have a clear line of sight with a base station and at the end a poor channel. One way to kind of improve the quality of your channel is by creating this uh, uh, offloading through uh, UAVs that can uh, basically uh, help you creating uh, nice uh, line of sight uh, channels. Uh, and uh, we have been working on that over the last uh, couple of years. In particular, we looked at uh, what we call, uh, uh, you know, like long endurance UAVs, because one of the main problems with UAVs is, is kind of they have typically a very short flight time. You know, the, their battery has limited capacity. So we are talking here about like one hour, one hour and a half flight time. And the way you can create or, or, or end up uh, dealing with with uh, long endurance UAVs is by, for example, tethering them, having a tether, which of course limit their mobility, but still they can put themselves in the nice spot to create a line of sight. Uh, and, and then you have a long endurance and no, and you have also a line of sight kind of uh, communication channel. So that's uh, one solution, another solution. And the third solution is uh, of course, very popular these days, at least conceptually, is this uh, concept of uh, uh, reflecting intelligent surface. So this idea essentially where you, you go into downtowns and you paint, let's say, some of the facade of buildings with these meta surfaces that will allow you to reflect or act as a mirror uh, for the incoming or for some of the incoming waves in a way that you can create this virtual line of sight. So even if you have a blockage, basically because there is a nearby building, you can take advantage of that building to create 
a non-direct line of sight or a virtual line of sight through this reflection and basically bypass this line of sight uh, limitation or this obstacle that is uh, in your way. So, you know, uh, I think people are actively looking uh, at this problem and uh, there are many solutions out there. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, uh, the, the hopefully, uh, I mean, although 5G is, uh, let's say, uh, kind of... Uh, uh, uh, uh, kind of using, at least in, in theory or, or, or on paper, using millimeter wave. To my best knowledge, I don't think it's kind of widely implemented or deployed. What is deployed is still in the lower part of the RF spectrum. But as we move for further to the millimeter wave, maybe some of the sol solutions will be more practical and will be part of our uh, kind of uh, uh, practical deployment of uh, 5G networks. I got my all answers. Uh, thank you for thank your you. time. And I'm appreciated to meet you. Uh, and now uh, I want to uh, give to round uh, Mr. Gül. Uh, it's your turn, Mr. Gül. Uh, you you can ask your question. Of course. Thank you very much for the words. Uh, and could you put the question to the screen? Okay. Uh, Dennis asked some question related to 5G and now uh, people start to work on, uh, have already started to work on uh, 6G. Uh, first they consider uh, the uh, beyond 5G approach and then uh, they will look for uh, the 6G, uh, 6G research directions. And uh, as I see, uh, as I look for, uh, as I look at the uh, papers of uh, Professor Aluni, I see a paper, uh, what should 6G be? So I am directly asking, what should 6G be? And uh, how does the 6G differ from 5G? Uh, what brings uh, us, uh, uh, what, what the 6G brings us, uh, we, uh, which uh, haven't been uh, given by the 6, uh, 5G? 5G and uh, why do we need uh, for 6G and uh, could you talk uh, about the application scenarios or the key features uh, supported by 6G communication for example for the 5G people generally talking about enhanced mobile broadband communication uh, and ultra low uh, late uh, ultra reliable and low latency communication and enhanced uh, mobile broadband uh, and mass, uh, massive machine type communication. Uh, and what are the key features uh, in the 6G? Thank you, Omar, for this uh, interesting question. Uh, to answer this question, I think, uh, le let me put this question of 6G in its context, because maybe some of the, uh, the participants here are, uh, let's say, still young, uh, master or uh, PhD students and may maybe they have not they, they don't have like uh, the big picture so I think it's good to remind everyone how, how it is and how it works so you know historically uh, we start using uh, kind of this G 1G 2G etc kind of terminology in the 80s so basically the first generation of cellular communication system was deployed in the 80s and then one, while the first G was deployed people start already working on 2G in the 80s so that 2G came in the in the 90s, and then 2000 brought 3G, uh, 2010 4G, and now 220 we are deploying 5G. So in a nutshell, it's taking us about 10 years to kind of design, uh, develop, uh, eventually deploy a generation of wireless communication system, and another 10 years to start using it, start testing it, start like massively deploying it, and eventually kind of uh, retiring it or kind of put it in a, a as a backup and because the new generation is picking up. Okay, that's the general context, which means now 2020, we start, as you see in the news, deploying 5G. You know, in many cities in the world, not everywhere, but many cities in the world are starting talking about 5G deployment, which means in the kind of academic circles uh, that are active, of course, in wireless communication, in the industrial uh, kind of uh, uh, companies that are very much uh, into wireless communication, here we are talking about Nokia, Ericsson, Huawei, you know, all of these kind of high-tech technology company, high-tech companies in wireless communication, already they start brainstorming about 6G. Okay, so 6G is not tomorrow, of course. 6G is going to be probably deployed by uh, the late 2020s or probably early 2030, but now we start just brainstorming, like thinking what 6G should be, what 6G might be, what would be the nice application, what are things we missed in 5G that we can fix in 6G, and so on and so forth. 
So this effort started relatively early. I would say if I look at how things went in 3G, 4G, 5G, it took us a little bit more time to get into this uh, brainstorming exercise. But somehow 6G started quite early. And the first 6G summit, to my best knowledge, was organized in Finland in 2019. Mm -hmm. It was a spring 2019. And then a lot of samples, yeah, workshops, special issues. Uh, and then, of course, a lot of people start writing this vision perspective paper on 6G, which kind of indicates that, uh, first of all, wireless communication is becoming a very big part in our lives. It's becoming like part of really our, uh, uh, not only kind of just a few engineers, but really kind of uh, uh, kind of a, uh, a mainstream societal kind of uh, issue and people are interested to know about uh, how 5G is going to work and what 6G could be or might be or should be. So um, uh, this is the start early. So I will give you my own uh, kind of perspective. My, my, my, my own perspective is uh, 6G will have, uh, let's say, twofold mission. Number one, uh, we cannot stop uh, the progress of science and technology. So 6G will continue pushing the envelope. Whatever we did before, trying to improve what we have, is going to continue as a natural evolution of the Gs. So uh, I call that hyper-connecting the connected. So those of us who are already connected will be, will be always aspiring to have a better connectivity. What can be a better connectivity? It can be, for example, a situation where we need to combine user scenarios. So 5G was about this kind of more or less independent user scenario, like, for example, enhanced mobile broadband and ultra-reliable low latency, and uh, basically massive machine type communication, but you may end up scenarios, have ending up with scenarios where these are combined. Like when we talk about, for example, uh, virtual reality gaming, okay? So probably you need enhanced mobile broadband combined with ultra reliable low latency communication. Two is scenario that have to be met simultaneously within the same application. And that's of course something that is not possible now that we need to be kind of designing or thinking as part of 6G evolution. When we talk about this kind of, for now, maybe it's a bit of a dream or for science fiction, but uh, uh, holographic telepresence technology, which is available and you probably have seen some demos, but if you want to push to the mainstream, which means like we do now with Zoom or Skype, it's everyone like uh, log in and, and, and do that. Maybe 10, 15 years down the road, this will become the norm. Like every time we want to kind of video conference, let's say in 3D, that will be something that everyone is able to do. And that can be something that is, of course, not possible now. And that will require like uh, a lot of more uh, sophistication in terms of the amount of data that we can transfer in real time. But that's the next frontier that 6G may start looking at. When we look also at how things around us may evolve, for example, uh, as we have probably seen uh, in, in many of these YouTube kind of uh, uh, clips, or let's call them, this kind of strong interest in flying cars in autonomous flying vehicles or electric vehicles. Uh, this can be part of our ecosystem in, in the 30s uh, because these uh, flying cars can help uh, decongest uh, the already congested, uh, uh, you know, basically either underground or ground uh, uh, uh, transportation system of, uh, uh, of cities. Uh, so this near ground space, you know, the space that is underused, we have been using quite a bit the, you know, the regular uh, terrestrial space for transportation, the underground for transportation, the space like the air for airplanes. But what is being used now by helicopters is, is underused. And maybe these flying cars are going to become the norm to solve this congestion problem in downtowns and also to solve very, uh, another very important problem, which is known as the last mile problem. How to access these remote villages, this hard to reach area, this remote uh, areas in an efficient way uh, without having to make roads everywhere. Maybe these flying cars will, will solve that problem. But why I'm talking about that? Because these cars would require a network to connect them. To connect them because if they're autonomous, you need to control and command them in a very reliable fashion. And because probably the passenger in these cars would like to enjoy internet connection during their trip. So uh, you need also to entertain and to kind of serve these kind of users that are not part of our ecosystem now. So this is what I call pushing the envelope part of 6G that we need to keep thinking about and try to kind of uh, design new networks or improve the current networks to be able to meet these requirements. Now, the second mission of 6G is a more of a sustainability driven uh, mission. Uh, you know, many of the things that we have been doing uh, are not sustainable. We cannot kind of keep going along the same lines, for example, from an energy efficiency perspective. 
Uh, you mm -hmm. know, like if 5G failed, then one thing is maybe uh, based on initial measurements and initial deployment kind of reports is that, uh, you know, the network are becoming more and more greedy in terms of power. So we need to develop more energy efficient network. And this comes from the device level, the network layer, uh, the protocols together. I mean, there were some initiatives uh, uh, along green touch uh, kind of and so on in the 2010, but I think we need to revisit that and a strong effort should be done to create more energy efficient network. And by energy efficient, of course, what we mean is network that still will deliver uh, super high performance, but they will do it uh, uh, with less power, less power, less uh, energy, so that essentially they are more sustainable, they are more green, uh, they are more, they will have less CO2 footprint, but also actually they will reduce the bill uh, for the cellular companies at the same time, it will make it uh, cheaper for the end consumer. So that's one aspect of sustainability. The other sustainability aspect that one can think of is equality. Uh, the network have been have not been basically very fair. Uh, there are still, uh, when I say fair on, on the global sense, there is still about half of world population that is uh, unconnected or underconnected. So when we talk about 5G and this densification, we are essentially talking about downtown areas, areas that are already very well covered that we are just trying to help them being better covered or covered with better speed. But what about the remote villages, rural areas, uh, you, you know, low income neighborhoods sometimes where connectivity is there, but people cannot afford to have, uh, you know, like a monthly subscription to very expensive or very confusing, let's say, data plans. So 6G would be also about, the second mission of 6G would be about connecting the unconnected. Uh, and this is something that is very uh, dear to me. I have been quite, uh, uh, quite interested in this topic uh, over the last uh, couple of years. And I don't think we should do that just from a purely humanitarian aspect. Actually, it is an opportunity. Because as soon as you start connecting the unconnected, you'll be creating tremendous opportunities for this remote region, for these rural areas, for this low-income neighborhood. You'll be banking the unbanked. You'll be offering maybe remote education to people who will not be able to be educated otherwise. You'll be able to help uh, in health applications telehealth or e-health application, people uh, that will be uh, hard to kind of cure uh, if they, they have to travel to cities or things like that. So that's in a nutshell. And to answer your, uh, your, your, your, your, your, your, you know, your question on 6G, Omar, from a perspective point of view, in my view, 6G has two missions, pushing the envelope and hyper-connecting the connected and be more sustainable, which means be more energy efficient and connect the unconnected. Mm -hmm. uh, let me say that. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, there's a problem. Uh, so someone opened both YouTube link as I see. Uh, okay, now. Uh, professor, you say that uh, energy efficiency in 6G, and as I remember, six, uh, six years ago when I. Uh, when I listen to talk about uh, 5G directions, uh, people talk about energy efficiency in uh, 5G, but uh, you say that uh, 5G a bit uh, ignored, uh, doesn't consider uh, energy efficiency so much. And it was interesting uh, because- yeah, well, I what I, yeah, what I said, I feel uh, that uh, more emphasis was on spectral inf efficiency on basically mm -hmm. record the data rate speed but maybe less effort or less cognitive uh, radio networks. Uh, people focus on the cognitive radio networks and spectrum efficient uh, efficiency very much, uh, resource management issues. Uh, yeah. so and if you look at, uh, there is this uh, few papers that were published by China Telecom and by, uh, you know, as you know, 5G, uh, I mean, the China has in a way a little bit of a heads uh, up on, on other uh, countries in terms of 5G deployment. And if you see some initial reports based on uh, the, the network uh, kind of mm -hmm. consumption, you know, some of these white paper are mentioning like three, four times more power consumption for the same coverage area. So, uh, you know, of course they are delivering much better performance in terms of speed, but I think this is coming at the expense of much more power. Uh, and which means to me that this is an area where we didn't do enough effort or maybe didn't pay enough attention. And I think it's some area where we need to revisit and we need to do a better job in terms of uh, kind of uh, delivering more energy efficient uh, uh, wireless network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I already uh, the research on uh, energy harvesting uh, wireless sensor networks, and I know uh, that area. And as I uh, as I also observe, uh, 
uh, in that area people generally uh, use greedy policy my pick policies and uh, we need more uh, efficient uh, policies i have already proposed one uh, and I, I hope to propose more uh, uniform grand border policy and let me continue with the uh, next question um, professor uh, what are the opportunities provided but by uh, reconfigurable uh, configurable uh, intelligent surface uh, risk in 6G. Uh, I have heard uh, this, uh, this term, this uh, uh, surface uh, for one month, two months, uh, people are working uh, these issues and uh, what are the opportunities provided by this one in uh, the new era? Okay, this is also a very good question. Uh, you know, this is kind of a new paradigm the first time I heard about it, probably it was just, just about two years ago, the first time I heard about like one of my students came to my office and she told me that she read this paper about this uh, kind of uh, intelligent surface. So I was intrigued and I read the paper and I was also myself very interested and that's how I jumped into the, the area myself and I realized that actually I was not alone. A lot of people and some of the best people in our community got into this uh, uh, also, value, uh, also, uh, and as you see now, actually, most of the paper are archived. I mean, like a lot of paper has not been published yet. Actually, mm -hmm. in Turkey, we have one very good expert in the topic, uh, Professor Bashar, uh, Ertugur Bashar. In, in, uh, in, Ertugur Bashar from Koç University. Yeah, from Koç University. He, he is really good in this area too. And, you know, many other people like Marco Diranzo and uh, uh, Professor Aikildis was one of the pioneers, actually, even at the, at the time where people didn't call them reflecting intelligent surface. But so there are a lot of people actually who got into this area. Why? Because it's an exciting paradigm. It's, it's, it's kind of a, a paradigm that can actually deliver on energy efficiency. Of course, it's still at the at the early stage. Uh, it has been kind of uh, kind of put forward because of uh, all the development that happened in physics and material science, right? Mm -hmm. With these meta surfaces that are allow you to program them in a way that uh, essentially you can reflect uh, incoming waves in in all kind of direction, violating in a way the classical Snell law. This ability to basically create this kind of programmable uh, mirrors that can uh, direct uh, energy in desired not spot is a beautiful concept that allow us to think about uh, how we can create this virtual or non-direct line of sight and to uh, basically uh, uh, improve uh, coverage. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, reflecting surface can help from an energy efficiency perspective because without adding power, you can reflect uh, uh, energy in areas where basically there is lack of coverage because of blockages. Uh, you can uh, help in interference management. You can create this reflection to cancel uh, interfering signals. You can create some physical layer security solutions because at the end of the day, you can program this uh, intelligent service in a way that they can absorb all incoming waves and create no leakage. So you can create basically a completely uh, a kind of closed environment where nothing comes out of that environment and you create certain uh, physical security kind of uh, uh, based uh, uh, solutions. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, recently we have been, uh, as I told you, looking at uh, EMF aware, you know, yeah, electromagnetic field aware networks. And this actually, you can also program these, uh, uh, program these uh, reflecting surface in a way that you can minimize the level of, of radiation, you know, known as uh, SAR. So uh, uh, this can be part of your optimization problem uh, when you design these uh, reflecting surface. So uh, all the, what, what I would like to say, it's an exciting topic. It has been uh, uh, demonstrated uh, in terms of prototype by uh, already a few interesting researchers in the area of physics and material science uh, uh, and even people working in the, in the boundaries between telecommunication and physics and material science. And uh, although it at its early stage, I mean, just two years, uh, there has been tremendous work and a lot of paper in this area. So, you know, like any technology uh, in, in our field, uh, not everything is going to make it to the standard or to the real deployment, right? We we get excited about, uh, as researchers, we get excited about new paradigms, about new ideas. Uh, it gets researched uh, extensively by many of us in, in all these universities. And then some of these uh, ideas make it to the standard, make it to real kind of uh, product. And some others uh, remain as interesting uh, papers that essentially never make it to to actual deployment. So we are at the early stage. It's promising. Is it going to make it to five years approximately? Generally, it takes uh, five years to uh, design uh, to make the brainstorm and five years to deploy. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we are in this brainstorming stage. So there are a lot of competing ideas. 
so I, I don't know the timing exactly, but uh, the brainstorming can stay for, I mean, can, can, can, can and brainstorming also can, can start from just very high level ideas all the way to more detailed kind of proof of concept. But then at some point, ITU is going to kind of uh, uh, come up with this uh, document. It was called IMT Advanced for 4G. It was called IMT 2020 for 5G. Maybe they will call it uh, Network 2030 or IMT 2030, where basically, the, you know, the ITU will not tell you, you use a reflecting surface or use UAV. They will tell you, you know, we want this kind of uh, vision. We want this kind of data rates. We want this kind of energy efficiency. We, we want this kind of connectivity or global connectivity. Now it's up to the uh, IEEE 3GPP uh, kind of uh, community to develop the right standard. Is it going to be based on spectrum sharing? Is it going to be based on UAV? Is it going to be based on intelligent surface? This is going to be evolving over the next uh, uh, few years. OK, uh, we can continue with the next question. Uh, in fact, uh, I ask this question as the fourth question, uh, part of this question as the fourth question. Six year research has uh, just started for one year, and uh, so there exist many challenges and so opportunities in six year research. And could you talk about future research directions toward the uh, 6G? And in fact, uh, we talk about re uh, reconfigurable intelligence surface and uh, also making some energy efficient, uh, increasing the energy efficiency in future communication. Uh, and uh, also, I want to ask, uh, when I see, uh, when I look at your paper, you, uh, you say that uh, the key features of the 6G, high security, secrecy, and privacy. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this will gain more importance in this new generation communication. Uh, and uh, do you think, the, uh, because people uh, work on some uh, new uh, secure uh, protocols on, for example, uh, blockchain co uh, blockchain protocols and some other uh, protocols. Uh, do you think uh, we can uh, apply these protocols efficiently uh, and uh, we can copy these uh, projects until uh, the 6G de uh, deployment? Because uh, yeah. people start with uh, B uh, Bitcoin. Uh, the first generation of blockchain and the uh, smart contracts as the second generation of blockchain. And now they consider Hyperledger uh, and thus they consider blockchain 3.0, uh, uh, so third generation blockchain. And uh, some people say that uh, we can uh, we can uh, reach the secure internet and different version and more secure internet more distributed internet via this blockchain, uh, uh, third generation blockchain. And uh, so uh, I, uh, I wonder whether we can complete this secure internet, the more distributed internet uh, and more connected internet uh, until 6G deployment. Yeah, uh, obviously, although I'm not really an expert in this uh, aspect, that obviously privacy, uh, security, uh, confidentiality, authentication uh, are very important aspect of uh, not only 5G, but of course 6G. As we start relying more and more on our daily transaction, financial mm -hmm. transaction, on wireless communication, it's uh, it's clear that, the, oh, and as we rely more on them uh, in this industrial IoT context, in controlling our cities, our transportation systems, it becomes critical to make sure that basically uh, our network are super secure. Uh, and um, again, uh, I mean, blockchain is one way to do that. Uh, uh, you know, when you talk about optical link, uh, people are developing all of these quantum uh, key distribution based solution. So, yes, we need to improve in cryptography. We need to improve in uh, in security techniques. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, it's not, this is not really my, my, my area of expertise, but, you know, it's an area obviously that requires a lot of uh, effort and a lot of uh, uh, extra uh, work to make sure that uh, we further improve uh, this example, aspect of wireless yeah. communication. For example, uh, in 5G, we consider uh, ultra, uh, ultra reliable low latency communication, but in 6G, uh, you are talking about secure, ultra low, uh, uh, secure, re reliable. Yeah. yeah, this is like this kind of aspect of uh, you can even lower the uh, like the, the latency from one millisecond, let's say around three to even a fraction of a millisecond. But on the top of that, this has to be uh, secure and, and completely kind of. Uh, uh, uh, no one can jam it or can eavesdrop on it. Uh, so uh, yes, this aspect is there. But um, 
you know, there are other aspects. I mean, that uh, what we talked about now is more the vision of 6G, right? Energy efficiency, you know, connecting the unconnected, uh, um, you know, hyper connectivity. But how can we do that uh, in terms of research topics? Uh, you know, I, I would say that uh, some of the interesting research topics that are being uh, pursued and or that we, we, we can continue pursuing is. Uh, you know what I call extreme bandwidth communication. You know, if you want to to to to go for this 3D video conferencing, which means you want to go to terabit per second type of data rates, uh, obviously millimeter wave uh, may not be enough, and you need to go to this extreme bandwidth of terabit per second that can be uh, delivered uh, in the terahertz part of the spectrum, or even if you push further, as I mentioned earlier, the optical part of the spectrum, this optical wireless communication system using LIFA, using free space optics. That's an area that maybe it's time to start looking at it, not only from a research perspective, but from a, a practical deployment uh, uh, perspective. So uh, extreme bandwidth communication is one area. Another area that is picking up uh, very nicely and that is connected to this theme of connecting the unconnected is this uh, what people call uh, uh, three-dimensional integrated terrestrial airborne space network. How you create these different layers of network satellites, airborne, which means... Yeah, like it's to our next question also, uh, and yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, like but... UAVs, like uh, high altitude platforms, like uh, tether balloons, and how to integrate that with terrestrial networks. So this is actually uh, another interesting uh, research direction that is being uh, quite a bit researched, uh, and that is still a uh, very active uh, research uh, topic for 6G. And then I would say, um, of course, uh, you know, AI, AI for wireless communication. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so AI is now a, a very important tool. Uh, it's kind of uh, being kind of used in, in the upfront of all the uh, technologies and in our daily life. So obviously wireless communication uh, techniques uh, at the physical layer, at the network layer, uh, can benefit from AI as, uh, as has been demonstrated over the last uh, few years. And uh, as such, uh, uh, that's another interesting uh, intelligent network is a, or AI-based network is another interesting research direction uh, as part of uh, the 6G development. Mm -hmm. uh, in our second question, uh, we consider uh, satellite communications and can people, can all people access the free internet in the future? Uh, for example, uh, Elon, Elon Musk uh, considers the start to Starlink project and uh, there, there are uh, thousands, uh, there are many, uh, lots of uh, satellites on the uh, on yeah, sky. Yeah. Okay. As, as, as I know, uh, 33 decades ago, uh, people considered, uh, again, the st satellite communications and they invent uh, money, uh, too much money on that uh, projects. But uh, sometimes satellite communication, uh, not sometimes, in general, satellite communication uh, remains as hype. Uh, so, uh, do you think really uh, this time uh, people achieve uh, they, their uh, goals uh, in satellite communications and uh, can all the people access the free internet in the uh, future without uh, without registering to the uh, nation nationwide institutes uh, for example Turkish Telecom British Telecom or the other thing uh, uh, do you think they can uh, gain the internet? No, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, yes, probably. I, I think this is go along the line of connecting the unconnected theme. I, I think this problem is going to be solved by 2030. Yeah, this is really because you are showing much importance on uh, more connectivity, and you are talking about more connectivity issues in the uh, sixth year. That is why I ask uh, this question. Yeah, yeah. So I'm saying I, I think this connect and unconnect problem should be, and uh, my, my expectation, it will be solved by 2030. Uh, using these uh, satellite networks, this network of hubs, or like this integrated terrestrial airborne satellite network. So this is a, a fact. Uh, I mean, at least in in, in in the mind of many of us. Uh, for free, this I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure it's going to be for free. Uh, as you may know, uh, currently uh, Starlink has started like what they call beta, I think, uh, uh, kind of deployment or beta testing, which means that uh, they selected few customers in some of the areas that are uh, close to the North Pole, because this is where they have uh, kind of coverage for now. And they are uh, getting volunteers. And it costs, I think, $500 to get the 
the antenna and the the monthly subscription i think is 50 dollars or, or maybe 150 dollars i don't remember exactly but it's somewhere like that so it's not for free okay but mm -hmm. still for some people this is great because this is still uh, for like a 100 megabit kind of uplink or, or, or like around that uh, the dozens of uh, uh, like 100 megabit downlink maybe few tens of megabit uplink this is uh, for some areas where basically there is no coverage this is heaven this is great kind of uh, uh, connectivity so uh, if you go back what, what we have we, what we are able to scale very well now is uh, kind of wireless communication in dense uh, areas because we have fiber optics and we can densify and use uh, several networks and then when you go kind of uh, in, in remote areas become difficult we, we, we satellite are great uh, to to have global coverage but for broadcasting like that's why for example tv broadcasting with satellite has been a success story but internet broadband kind of downlink uplink uh, with satellite is still very expensive okay uh, another idea with all of these uh, uh, and there are many trends there is a trend of this so-called very high throughput satellite these are like still geostationary satellite but that are processing up to i mean in the future probably terabit per second uh, and they have this kind of multi-beam technology which means they can cover simultaneously multiple areas uh, this is one kind of direction that will kind of help in the direction of connecting these unconnected regions and then there is what we talked about this uh, you know the starlink spacex project the kuiper project of amazon the OneWeb uk project uh, the teresat leo of canada uh, chinese i think they have also their own projects so there is this race towards this mega elio constellation to create this back hole uh, a kind of a satellite network to provide this global connectivity uh, i think still uh, the, the, these require quite a bit of investment and uh, to me uh, are they going to be free? Uh, I doubt. I think uh, what what's going to happen is, and uh, I mean, of course I'm a researcher here. I can't, I'm not here to predict how business will will evolve. But it seems to me that when I look at people who are interested in this kind of uh, uh, uh, solution, it's different than what it was 20, 30 years ago when many of these projects, let's say, didn't pick up or failed. When you remember the Teledisic project that failed or the Iridium, which became a niche, these are pure telecom projects, uh, like by telecom operators. Whereas here you see the big players are actually like uh, big tech companies, like Google, Facebook, uh, uh, like uh, Microsoft. They are not really after uh, just connecting the unconnected. They are after the next thing, which is once I connect the unconnected, I'm going to bank the unbanked. And maybe I will not make my money based on the how much I'm going to charge you for the connection. So it's not going to be free, but maybe it's like a, a little amount of money. But the way I will make my money is basically on every single transaction you make with your uh, uh, money mobile. You know, for example, in Africa, there's a success story in Kenya. I think it's called Mepeza or something like that. This is mobile money. So basically, you use your mobile phone like your credit card. And then, of course, uh, I mean, the, the middleman, which is this mobile money kind of operator, is getting maybe, I don't know, like a fraction of a percent or one percent on every transaction and that's how you make your network sustainable uh, financially and you make it basically profitable so i believe that can be a good direction a direction i mean a good i'm not sure but i'm saying a viable uh, economical direction where basically people are going to be either after your data like the google and so on or after your money uh, because you are going to use them as your bank account and maybe it's a win-win situation at the end of the day you know it's like every, all these it tools where basically you, uh, you know, yeah, you you have the right price, but of course you have to give up something, which is it can be some of your data or or, or some a fraction of your financial transaction because of the ease of uh, doing financial transaction for people in rural areas who don't have access to a bank account. You know, this mobile money becomes their bank, and then they can uh, they can uh, you know uh, on return get the connectivity for many other things. So uh, you know, I, I think. Uh, Definitely uh, this move, this uh, kind of momentum behind, uh, uh, I would say not only satellites, satellite, hubs, uh, because they can work very well together. Uh, and maybe hubs can be kind of uh, the bridge toward uh, these satellites. Hubs can be good for access. Satellite can be good for backhaul. Uh, these other tether balloon, tether airships. So there is a multitude of solution and maybe there's no one size fits all, depending on situation, depending on the environment, depending on the density of population on the ground, you may have, uh, uh, the right kind of network to deploy and uh, 
depending on the service you'll be offering to your user, uh, you, you, you can go for the set of services that uh, basically uh, you can make the operation a win-win, a profitable situation for both sides. Mm -hmm. But Thank from you. a technical standpoint, uh, because this is at the end of the day, uh, you know, our main interest, uh, there are a lot of interesting problems uh, in mm -hmm. these kind of integrated uh, networks. Uh, you know, like one problem that we are looking at these days is, um, uh, you know, you, uh, how do you deploy these 3D networks? You know, we, we have been good at deploying 2D networks, but now when we are starting having 3D, which means you have the third dimension, and uh, which means you can play with altitude, and the higher you are, the bigger is your footprint. But of mm -hmm. course, you can have also interference between different systems. And this, uh, uh, but of course, you have a big footprint, uh, but uh, you, you have a certain capacity. So, I mean, like a classical problem that uh, will come to the mind of everyone, given the density population on the ground, what would be the optimal deployment in terms of altitude of this network? You know, may, maybe, uh, you know, typically we have this power low distribution population around cities, which means that the population density decrease from downtown to the surrounding, let's say, suburb all the way to rural areas and essentially what's going to happen that the the network will follow the inverse kind of flow which means uh, like the you, the altitude of the network like basically you start densifying quite a bit uh, terrestrially in downtown and then as you go away you start trying to go uh, uh, using uh, maybe uh, lap uavs and eventually hubs and eventually at some point only satellites so these are the kind of interesting technical problem that uh, uh, people like ourselves who are in the research community and wireless communication can get into and can keep working on uh, in the coming years. Yeah, uh, we can continue with the last question. Uh, today we talk about 5G, uh, beyond 5G and 6G. And uh, as you may know, uh, already know, uh, people call the uh, 3G as the operator centric uh, generation and 4G as the service centric and the 5G as the user centric communication and we have uh, we now uh, are that the at the age of the the new communication 6G communication uh, and it provides uh, new challenges and so new opportunities and as a young professional what are your uh, advices uh, so that uh, not only me uh, but also uh, all these uh, audience can launch our uh, launch our career uh, careers uh, successfully uh, yeah, yeah. They, they... So I mean, I, I like your description of different generation. From, from uh, I mean, before answering the question, uh, uh, let me comment on on what you said. From my perspective, uh, if I have to give like a, a key word for six G, is uh, basically uh, it should be inspired by sustainability. Six G should be also about sustainability, sustainable solutions. Uh, we need to keep pushing the envelope, keep whatever has been done before. But on the top of that, we need to be more sustainable. Uh, and sustainability is a kind of a broad term to cover, uh, you know, issues related to environment, related to energy, and related to uh, equality between access to, uh, of opportunities to people, uh, you know, worldwide. Uh, now, going back to uh, my advice, uh, to, to, to I assume the audience are master students, PhD students, maybe very young professionals who just graduated, who, who are doing a postdoc, or maybe start their academic careers. So my, my first advice, I, I have two advice. My first advice is, is to be passionate about research if you want to get into a research career. Uh, you know, uh, don't get to uh, like PhD just because uh, you want to get this extra degree. This is not, uh, uh, this is always my advice to my master's students. You can be a very bright student, you can be an A student, but maybe you are not meant to, to do research. Uh, if you want another degree, maybe you can go and do an, AB, an MBA and you can be as successful, if not more successful. But if you want to do a PhD, if you, are, if you choose uh, for your career uh, to be um, a researcher, uh, you need to be passionate about research. You need to be ready to keep uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, working in a, in a quite competitive environment, as, as you will see as PhD students. Uh, you'll be always uh, trying to be the first at developing an idea. Uh, so it's kind of an Olympic game on a daily basis. So if you are not passionate about that, uh, I don't think uh, someone can be successful. Uh, and you need to find the passion in yourself and, and go in, uh, and work in that, that direction, okay? Uh, that's, you know, just an, an advice about research in general that I always give to my students, especially those who are at the, at the level of making a decision. Uh, usually this happens at the end of a master thesis or, or the, in the middle of a master. Uh, I mean, a, a master thesis is a mini PhD thesis. It's kind of an idea what would be your life 
as a researcher. So if you enjoy the experience, you know, that's maybe a good indicator. If it was not that great of an experience, that's a good sign maybe that actually you should probably look for something more exciting for you to do uh, with your career. Now, uh, if you choose to, to go into a research career, uh, I think uh, it's always important to try to kind of, uh, I feel, uh, successful people, especially in academia these days, are people who are able to cross bridges, who are able to work on interdisciplinary topics uh, and try to go uh, and get expertise from different areas. This can be achieved by taking courses uh, in different domains. It can be achieved by being co-supervised by two advisors with different uh, uh, kind of expertise. Uh, and uh, at Chaos, we have been quite successful doing that. So when you talk about, for example, optical wireless communication, uh, as a student, if you want to get the best advice, it, it's good to, to have uh, uh, to be co-supervised by a professor in communication, but also a professor in photonics, someone who understands very well lasers, who understands very well optoelectronic device, who understands very well basically photonic laws. And, uh, and uh, taking course from these two domains, working under these two supervisors, can open your mind and you can become actually better than these two professors because you know the two areas and you can be... Uh, you. In other words, what I'm trying to say, you should go beyond being the replica of your own advisor. You need at some point to bring something uh, added value, uh, uh, and this can be achieved by going beyond, you know, the comfort zone, doing the same thing that everyone else is doing in your area, uh, and this is one key to success. And this can be achieved uh, by, you know, trying to learn. Uh, what, like for example, when you talk about large intelligent service, uh, I think uh, trying to understand better the physics behind that, the material science, uh, can help you. Uh, uh, write better paper and can help you uh, uh, better paper in the sense that uh, do better research in this area, take into account communication aspect, but also physics kind of aspect. So these are my, you know, my, my I would say my two advice at this stage and, uh, and uh, yeah. for all of you who are starting their career as young professional, I wish you all the best and uh, I hope uh, that uh, uh, we will go back to, although, I mean, this, uh, let's say, webinars, and I have been doing a few of them over the last few months, uh, have been good to kind of make people close to each other, and it's much easier to connect. But nonetheless, probably, uh, we are all looking forward to go back to, uh, uh, you know, normal life, where we, we, we meet sometime face-to-face, uh, -face and we have a good uh, live discussion. And I hope we'll have other opportunities uh, after the pandemic, hopefully sometime in 2021 or 2022, where we will keep enjoying maybe some of these webinars because they are not hard to set up even in normal situation, but also we'll have opportunities to meet uh, face to face. Thank you. Thank you for, for this great talk, uh, this great uh, webinar. And uh, we are very uh, glad to have such a great webinar with you. And uh, we really inspired uh, from your words, uh, your research directions and uh, I think the audience also uh, inspired from your words. Uh, and uh, dear Denis, uh, we, uh, do we have any questions from the uh, audience? Uh, actually, we don't have uh, enough time to continue this session because our uh, next guest is still waiting at the uh, backup. Uh, so we have to end this session. And uh, I want to say uh, it's our pleasure to see here, uh, Mr. Aulini and Mr. Gil. Uh, and thank you for your beautiful uh, uh, advice. Uh, now uh, I'm taking them on my mind. And tomorrow I am going to work. I am <laughs> going to start work about them, about. Uh, and also uh, I'm going to start read 5G. And maybe it's, uh, the time is over for, over for 5G. I should start with 6G. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good idea. Uh, to, uh, yesterday, uh, also, I read your uh, paper, and that was also uh, very amazing. And uh, I want to thank, thank you, uh, both of, I want to thank both of you for joining us. Uh, I hope see you next time you. in another session or another webinar, and also uh, uh, maybe in a uh, face-to-face, uh, which I wanted more to. Certainly. Okay, then. Uh, it's our pleasure to see you Thank here. you very much. Thank you for the invitation and uh, see you in the near future. Thank, thank you. Thank you much for accepting our invitation and thank you for watching this uh, webinar. Thank you.
See you. Uh, Mr. Gül, uh, do you want to add something? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, watching this uh, webinar, uh, and we are very glad to uh, glad to see uh, your uh, great uh, interest uh, on this webinar. And uh, we hope uh, we can make uh, new interesting uh, programs and webinars uh, with uh, perhaps again with uh, Professor Aluni if uh, he will uh, if he is uh, suitable again or uh, another great uh, professors and. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Aluni, and uh, you are uh, among my idol, uh, idol person, idol uh, professors, and uh, I, I hope uh, I will, uh, I can, I will find more opportunity to focus on the communication uh, between my other areas related to UAV networks and robotic networks, and uh, this really inspired me for my research directions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, Denis, for your thank help. You. Thank you. Oh, Thank you it's, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Okay, then, uh, dear our audience, uh, our next session uh, will uh, start at five minutes later. Uh, please stay. So, uh, see you in next session.
Hello again. Uh, in our third and last session, the, the chairman of Communications Technologies Cluster, Ilhan Bauren, will be with us. Uh, Mr. Bauren, welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. Good evening. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, you can share your screen if you want. I'll try. Okay, we can see your screen. Can you see? Okay. And then I'll switch to slide mode. Okay, it works. Okay, uh, good evening. Uh, I will try to give you a, a glimpse of uh, what is 5G and uh, how it is approaching uh, Turkey, hopefully. It's going to be uh, at the uh, time of the night. Uh, could be uh, part exciting, part uh, bedtime story. Uh, I am the uh, chairman of the uh, Turkish uh, cluster for uh, telecommunications technologies. It's called uh, HTK. And I'm also the uh, founder and CEO of uh, one of the telecom companies in Turkey. Uh, called Telenity. Uh, 5G is uh, very different from the prior uh, generations. Uh, and what makes it uh, different, different is uh, it's not a telecommunication standard. Uh, it can't be called a telecommunication standard. It's rather an industry standard. Uh, to tell you the difference, uh, until 4G, uh, usually the telecom uh, operators and telecom vendors uh, came together and decided uh, what would be the contents of uh, the next generation and uh, did their best uh, to use the latest uh, technologies. And then the operators uh, used it uh, mostly uh, for consumers. Uh, 2G, 3G uh, was mostly for consumers. Uh, 4G is uh, a mix. But in 5G, uh, the whole industry uh, decided what should be the uh, standard. Uh, so uh, experts from all industries came together and uh, uh, told uh, ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, which uh, decides what should be the contents of the next generation. Uh, about their needs for the next uh, uh, 15 years. And then uh, those, uh, uh, what you may call use cases, uh, were gathered and uh, uh, the telecommunication industry was asked to uh, find uh, solutions to these. And uh, uh, more and more work uh, was uh, uh, uh, done to uh, decide uh, what should be the uh, technical limits. And uh, uh, from time to time, it uh, eventually uh, happened that there were three important uh, requirements and uh, those uh, could make the uh, uh, ends of this uh, triangle. Uh, they are uh, quite different than each other. Uh, the one on the top is the enhanced mobile uh, broadband, uh, which means uh, up to 10 gigabits per second. Uh, it is about uh, 100 times faster than uh, 4G. The, uh, the, the one on the uh, bottom left hand side is uh, massive machine type communications. Uh, that was uh, about 1000 uh, devices per kilometer for uh, kilometer square for 4G for 5G uh, we, we need much more dense uh, device uh, devices so uh, the requirement is 1 million devices per kilometer square and the third uh, requirement uh, is the one on the uh, lower right hand side ultra reliable <laughs> low latency communications 
uh, which is when you uh, send a, a query to the network, you should be able to get up to one millisecond uh, response. And you can see how all other uh, all uh, industries or applications fall in this uh, triangle. Like uh, as you may uh, might expect, uh, self-driving car is uh, closer to the uh, uh, low latency, ultra reliable communications. Uh, ultra reliable because we, uh, we we must know that we are going to get a response. Other, otherwise, there will be an uh, accident. And uh, it it has to be low latency, both reliable and low latency. Uh, however, when you talk about smart city or maybe farming. Uh, you are closer to the uh, massive machine type communications because you may put uh, a, a sensor in uh, every corner, every uh, every pole of the uh, city. The one on the top is uh, very uh, similar to what we have right now. Uh, usually, uh, just faster uh, uh, mobile broadband speeds. Uh, now, uh, how is, uh, other than these requirements, uh, how is 5G different uh, than the pre predecessors? Uh, one um, important uh, feature of 5G is it's end-to-end -end scalable. What do we mean by end-to-end -end scalable? For 4G, you couldn't uh, uh, guarantee any quality of service based on a, a network. Uh, you could uh, probably do a, a best case uh, scenario for parts of the network, but you couldn't guarantee an end-to-end KPI for uh, 4G. The mechanisms were just not there. With 5G, uh, although it's a, a mostly virtual uh, system, uh, you will be able to uh, give guarantees. Uh, okay, you will get uh, 15 uh, milliseconds response or you will get uh, 45 uh, gigabits per second or wh whatever, but uh, it, it is measurable and uh, so scalable. The other uh, important thing is it's very agile. Uh, it doesn't require a, a base station near you. Uh, even uh, existence of a Wi-Fi or uh, satellites uh, uh, near you is uh, enough for uh, connecting to 5G. So um, most likely by 2025, if you can breathe, uh, most likely you will also get 5G coverage in anywhere around the world. Uh, the other important uh, difference of 5G is it's software-based. Uh, usually, in 4G, when an operator uh, bought their network infrastructure, it was 80%, uh, 90% hardware and uh, up to 20, 25% software. With uh, 5G, it's mostly software uh, and it's uh, virtualized. Uh, uh, there are no, uh, there are base stations, uh, not, not even, uh, most of the base stations are also software uh, for 5G. So the antenna of the uh, base station is the only specific hardware. The rest is uh, ideally uh, standard uh, hardware. Uh, and it's based on open standards, open source, and uh, standard uh, hardware, as I uh, mentioned. We call them white boxes. Uh, uh, you can uh, purchase them uh, not specific to your uh, application uh, and then put any 5G application on it uh, based on virtualized uh, systems. The important, one important thing is it's based on open standards uh, for the uh, minimum parts. Uh, until uh, 5G, usually the network was uh, dividable to only uh, two or three pieces and then that big pieces were delivered by large uh, vendors like uh, Ericsson Nokia or Huawei uh, and uh, you can you couldn't divide it further with 5g uh, the network is made of uh, from many parts and those parts are connected to each other using open standards 
if you uh, in 4G, if you bought a, a base station, uh, you couldn't uh, uh, buy a better antenna for that base station. Whoever you bought that uh, base station from, you had to buy your antenna from them or uh, uh, front end, digital front end. Uh, in this case, there will be best of breed uh, small uh, vendors, small startups who are very good on one thing and they will be able to sell their uh, products. And the uh, other uh, very important thing, especially for uh, uh, smaller uh, uh, developers or countries like Turkey who are uh, not uh, leaders in technology, uh, to jump into this uh, bandwagon using open source. Uh, 5G will be uh, deployed uh, mostly by uh, using open source uh, components. Uh, operators will uh, force the uh, vendors to develop based on open, uh, open source uh, software, which uh, the operators themselves are contributing. So. Most of the operators are now contributing to open source communities and asking their uh, vendors to build their uh, devices based on those uh, open sources. So uh, Ericsson, uh, Huawei, Nokia, or uh, three, uh, two or three uh, young star uh, startups uh, will start from the same place. Uh, the, 30, 40, 50 years uh, uh, long learning of uh, uh, Huawei or Ericsson will not uh, make them, uh, give them an advantage other than their experience, obviously. A very uh, important feature of uh, 5G is uh, network uh, slicing. Uh, network slicing, uh, means uh, you can provide a certain set of capabilities as a, a virtual network to uh, applications. Uh, I, can, uh, I can probably better describe network slicing uh, going back to this uh, picture. If you, can, uh, if you look at the three uh, corners of this uh, triangle, it is almost impossible to provide all these capabilities together uh, around the uh, coverage area. Uh, most likely when you, when you need 10 gigabit per second broadband bandwidth, probably you, you don't need one millisecond response time. Uh, or when you, when you have a million devices, uh, like uh, meters that you measure once a month, you really don't need high bandwidth or ultra reliable low latency communications. So rather than uh, providing all of these at all places, 5G will offer a, a combination of these as uh, packages. Like uh, you will say, I will need a, a slice. Uh, it's, it's like picking uh, from a menu. I will need uh, one gigabit per second, uh, two, 2,000 devices per kilometer, and 20 milliseconds uh, response time. This will be a slice. So uh, the operator's physical network will be uh, providing you virtual slices. So uh, there will be many, let's say, gaming slices. You will have uh, one millisecond response, 10 millisecond response, 40 millisecond response, slices of gaming. Uh, each will have obviously different uh, pricing. And uh, if your uh, friend uh, can kill uh, the guy on the game uh, faster than you, although you, you have seen the uh, guy uh, earlier, most likely you will be able to uh, pay a little more and uh, get a better slice. This also brings, uh, this is not only a technologically a revolution, it's also a revolution in the uh, business sense. Uh, that means there will be virtual operators that uh, that buy basic functionality from the physical operators that we ha have three of them in Turkey, and then uh, sell them, uh, probably uh, bundle them with uh, uh, industry-specific software like gaming or farming or uh, 
healthcare and then uh, sell slices to to the uh, end users or uh, vertical providers uh, so we expect uh, in the uh, in the future uh, hundreds of uh, virtual operators that operate on network slices uh, another important uh, uh, technology uh, as part of 5G is edge computing which is not tied to 5G uh, edge computing was uh, uh, started uh, earlier than 5G but uh, edge computing becomes a very essential part of uh, 5G edge computing uh, probably you may have heard uh, means uh, computing nodes very close to the end users for connectivity so uh, most likely very close to your uh, base stations uh, if there is uh, uh, a need for business like uh, assume uh, we are talking about a, a stadium or a, a airport uh, we most likely will have data centers very close to these areas rather than uh, traditionally uh, when you have a uh, need at the, let's say, uh, a stadium, uh, your, phone, uh, your phone connects to the data center at the center of the uh, mobile operator, and then the application is outside uh, the uh, operator's network. So it go goes on to the uh, application outside of the operator's network to the internet, and then comes <laughs> back. There is no way you can meet one millisecond, ten millisecond response times using using these. So edge computing allows the uh, computing nodes very uh, close to your phone or the or your uh, base station, and not only that, but also the third party applications to be sitting uh, on that platform. So uh, your uh, requirement will be served right at that edge computing device, and the response will be fed back to you without going into the uh, uh, data center of the operator. Uh, now, uh, when we talk about standards, uh, so far 5G uh, will uh, be delivered in three uh, releases. The first release, uh, uh, release one was the very first uh, 2G standard of uh, GSMA, uh, and it has been uh, increasing by 2G, 4, uh, 3G, 4G. 5G starts with release 15. And uh, the release 15 uh, was the very basic uh, uh, uh, functionality that allows uh, new nodes connected to four, four and a half G uh, base stations to provide uh, functionality behind uh, 4.5 G. Uh, so there are 5 G base stations connected to four and a half G base stations. And this, uh, this is called non-standalone. Release 16 uh, is delivered uh, uh, earlier uh, this year. Uh, unfortunately, because of the COVID pandemic, the work uh, was slowed down, so it was delivered about uh, three to six months uh, late. Uh, and uh, Release 16 provides basic uh, but standalone 5G uh, uh, functionality. So. Uh, 5G will uh, operate without the need of uh, the 4G components. Uh, so, such uh, that is called a standalone 5G. But uh, this uh, release 16 will provide uh, uh, most of the basic uh, connectivity, but will not provide uh, most of the uh, corners of that triangle. The corners of the triangle will be delivered by uh, release 17, which is targeted right now for the end of uh, 2021. Uh, in there, there will be uh, location technologies, uh, better satellite connection, uh, industrial uh, Internet of Things, uh, augmented uh, virtual reality cases, uh, and uh, broadcast multicast uh, capabilities will be added by uh, release uh, 17. Uh, now, uh, I would also want to talk about uh, how important uh, 5G is. This is a, a page uh, taken uh, from the presentation uh, made to Trump, uh, President, uh, US President Trump, uh, early uh, 2018 uh, by the National Security Administration. 
to uh, explain the importance of 5G. As you can see at the bottom, uh, to lead in, in the world politically, economically, and militarily, you have to be, we have to be leading 5G, was the conclusion arrived by uh, NSA uh, guys. And uh, as you can, uh, as you may remember, uh, from that point on, uh, United States started a technology and political war against China, uh, which was uh, ahead of uh, United States in terms of 5G technology. So it's uh, for most countries, uh, probably for every country, 5G should be the first priority in their uh, political list agenda. Uh, 5G uh, will enable uh, all other uh, industries and improve uh, productivity or uh, provide uh, capability for applications that were not uh, possible before. And you can see here uh, which uh, industries will uh, benefit most uh, from uh, 5G. As you can see, energy and utilities will be, uh, along with uh, manufacturing, will benefit a lot from uh, 5G capabilities. But all others, I mean, agriculture, automotive, financial services, retail, media and entertainment, public transport, uh, uh, they will uh, contribute a lot, uh, and it will be a, a 1.3 trillion industry uh, by uh, 2026. Uh, but the 5G, I, I have to say that 5G is not uh, necessarily a great uh, consumer uh, technology. I, I mean, it will provide uh, extensive uh, improvement to consumer applications, but uh, 5G will not uh, be feasible if there wasn't uh, its uh, applications and appeal and value provided uh, to the businesses. Uh, I mean, most of the time uh, so far, uh, the, uh, the consumers did not pay a lot for uh, an upgrade in technology. Like when you go from 2G to 3G, 3G to 4G, the, uh, the experience has been the, uh, the uh, consumer may pay about 10% more for this uh, great new gadget, but it settles down. So uh, uh, as you may ex uh, expect uh, from, from the earlier slides, uh, it's a huge investment for 5G. So just because you, you are watching the uh, movies better or faster, you are not going to pay double the price. So who is going to pay for uh, this massive uh, upgrade? Not consumers. I mean, 10% increase doesn't uh, justify this uh, investment. So the uh, investments and uh, investment and feasibility will come from the benefits uh, the uh, technology provides to the businesses. So. It is, uh, uh, we can uh, comfortably say that uh, 5G will be uh, targeting businesses and industries much more than <laughs> consumers. Uh, you can see different uh, services and applications uh, and uh, how uh, uh, willing the consumers are uh, to pay for these services uh, is the size of the bubble. And uh, left hand side is uh, sh shorter uh, time to market for those. Like uh, the one on the uh, most left, uh, left hand side, 5G TV will be most likely be the very first ones or gig gigabytes first, second or fixed wireless interface or immersed gaming will be available in the first year or so. Whereas uh, you, you go to the other end, connected robots and uh, 3D hologram calling or uh, uh, uh, augmented reality window will be probably four to five years uh, away. The very first services, uh, I mean, in the, in the United States uh, last year, uh, 5G started and very first service was fixed wireless access. Fixed wireless access is a uh, 
provides uh, an advantage to reach homes that are uh, about a mile from the latest fiber connectivity that you can it's it's not feasible to uh, connect to those uh, houses using uh, fiber so it's a uh, it's a cheap fiber replacement at that point you put a fixed wireless access base station and you provide fiber like capability uh, connectivity to all those homes and uh, small and medium uh, businesses uh, this this has been a, a ongoing business with 4G also but 4G picks up at uh, 10 me uh, me megabits per second which is not uh, like uh, the the uh, the uh, connectivity that you expect for your uh, home uh, video systems but 5G will provide gigabits per second uh, so anything you you are able to do with your cable connectivity or fiber connectivity uh, right now you'll you'll have equal or better with uh, uh, fixed wireless access and this is a low hanging fruit so uh, it's easy to make money from this so uh, these will will be the very first applications in every market uh, for for the markets that started uh, deploying 5g these are the earliest ones the second one is also another uh, important application of uh, 5g uh, it's uh, private networks uh, there will be uh, networks uh, set up by factories or industrial uh, buildings or uh, for enterprises to have their uh, private 5G network that connects to the rest of the world, but it's a private 5G network. They, these uh, uh, factories or enterprises will be able to buy, just like uh, they are buying Wi-Fi uh, networks now, they will be able to build their own 5G networks. Uh, what is different with uh, 5G network uh, uh, compared to what a factory may have uh, right now? Usually, the, uh, most of the industries of, or factories have lots of wired uh, equipment uh, that has to be uh, connected to each other and managed, uh, but they are uh, usually islands and uh, the, uh, the best technology they are connected is uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, 5G uh, provides um, uh, low latencies, reliability, security, real time, uh, and it's managed from the cloud. So the whole factory can be managed from a single uh, system, whereas uh, before 5G, uh, the factory was an uh, island of uh, wireless or wireless uh, equipment. Right now, you will be able to move uh, equipment. Uh, from uh, place to place and uh, wherever you put them, they will uh, start uh, working, not like uh, having to wire them. But this uh, also uh, b uh, brings up uh, uh, uh, some requirements for uh, regulations. Uh, each country is having a different approach to this. Uh, do we give uh, the license for the operators to sell uh, private uh, 5G networks? Or do we sell them, uh, uh, sell the licenses directly to these uh, uh, factories? And uh, who op who uh, delivers them? Who uh, operates them? Uh, is up in the air. Uh, so far in uh, Germany, uh, there are uh, about 80 factories who, uh, led by uh, car co companies Volkswagen. Uh, Mercedes and uh, BMW already have uh, 5G factories uh, and Bosch and uh, some uh, ports, uh, airports or seaports uh, in Germany already have licenses. Uh, the other uh, early uh, services are obviously media services, uh, synchronized multi-recording. Uh, you will be able to re record uh, with three artists in three different uh, locations. Uh, the real-time connectivity will allow uh, for that. Uh, you can have a 3D hologram, you will have video analytics. Uh, video analytics was very important for, for the Chinese to uh, fight with uh, COVID. Uh, they, they, they used 5G uh, for video analytics at the uh, common places to identify uh, people with uh, COVID. 
obviously gaming is uh, going to uh, benefit uh, a lot from uh, 5G capabilities. Uh, it will be uh, played by many, many players, uh, multiplayer games, uh, playing against uh, each other uh, with mixed reality and uh, it's uh, cloud, ba cloud based. Uh, as I said, business case uh, will be made uh, with uh, verticals. Uh, so uh, th these vertical industries uh, will pay for uh, for the uh, uh, 5G. So uh, most likely operators will be uh, trying to uh, serve the uh, what we call verticals are industries. Uh, uh, one thing we to keep in mind is. Uh, 5G comes with a value chain. Uh, what we discussed about uh, what operator deploys to provide 5G services is on the left hand side. I I uh, I try to uh, make it based on my uh, intuitive sizing, but the business wise 5G network, uh, which is uh, what the operators will uh, set up, is just a little piece of the value chain. What uh, provides uh, the uh, market value to 5G is, first of all, applications based on slicing. Uh, so there will be uh, agricultural applications, uh, healthcare applications that take 5G network and provide value to those uh, verticals. And then most of the value will come from the vertical uh, industries. On the right hand side, I, I try to uh, give a, a uh, representation of what might uh, uh, look like uh, sli slices. We are talking about three different applications here, and we are, to uh, as you may see, uh, one operator's network appears as three different uh, virtual networks. Uh, the one on the top is video. So what you do is uh, you you uh, you uh, deploy most of the systems closer to the uh, network. Whereas in telephony slice, you don't really need such high bandwidth. So you can deploy most of those things in the uh, core clouds. Uh, whereas in the critical uh, IoT slice, you would uh, move them closer to the uh, devices. And you, you like in this, uh, if this is an automobile case, uh, you, you would uh, uh, deploy uh, V2X uh, virtual uh, uh, uh, vehicle to any t anywhere connectivity, that means V2X server, closer to the uh, subscriber. And uh, these are uh, operated like three different networks, uh, whereas uh, physically they are a single network, but they can be operated as uh, virtual networks. Uh, these verticals, as I said, will pay uh, for the uh, 5G, and they will also make how uh, uh, make the uh, industries uh, competitive uh, globally. So, uh, if if the if these vertical applications are developed and the vertical industries start using those uh, new applications that make use of uh, 5G capabilities the industries will be uh, competitive uh, around the world. And if you delay it, uh, they will fall behind. Uh, in, in Europe, uh, there is a big uh, project called 5G PPP, uh, Public-Private Partnership. And for the last uh, five years, they have been working on many vertical projects uh, between uh, public companies, uh, universities, uh, small and large uh, enterprises. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in Turkey, we are uh, we are just uh, learning these things. Hopefully, we can get uh, involved in a uh, couple of these uh, 5G media. Uh, Netash, a Turkish company, is part of that consortium. I think. Uh, uh, another one, uh, uh, Fort Otosan, uh, is a uh, partner, but uh, we, we need to uh, jump into the back bandwagon as soon as possible to stay uh, uh, competitive. Uh, and then the, we can, to, uh, all, I would like to talk about how, how much the uh, global mobile economy contributes to the world's uh, uh, economy. Here you can see that 
global mobile economy contributes to 4.6 of the glo uh, global, global domestic pr product. Uh, product. Uh, and we expect uh, this to uh, reach uh, more than 5 with 5G. Unfortunately, right now uh, we are at 2.6% uh, uh, in Turkey. Uh, because we were late in uh, entering 4G, we didn't uh, uh, make up the difference yet with the rest of the world. Uh, and another uh, major problem with the uh, Turkish system is the high taxes. Uh, as you may know, uh, Turkey is uh, collecting highest uh, taxes uh, from, uh, from the consumer, uh, directly or indirectly, uh, three times the global average. Uh, so paying this much tax uh, makes uh, many of the businesses uh, not feasible. Uh, so like uh, MVNO business, uh, the business that I talked uh, about, the virtual network operator uh, business, has been active in uh, 80 countries around the world, uh, many of them much less developed than uh, Turkey. But uh, because of the taxes, uh, we were never able to uh, operate an MVNO in Turkey. Uh, for uh, for the 4G, well, uh, we could live without uh, MVNOs, but uh, we, with the 5G, if we cannot have a um, you know, business, um, we will not be uh, uh, competitive in in the world. Uh, how much how much time do I have? Uh, am I? Uh, we have still a little bit time. Okay. Okay. Uh, I would also like to uh, talk uh, a little bit about what is happening in Turkey. Uh, in Turkey, there is a, a communication technologies cluster that was established uh, three years ago, which I am the uh, head of the uh, uh, cluster. And uh, it's, uh, it has 140 firms. Uh, here are the, uh, I'm sorry, here is a list of uh, the uh, members. And uh, three years ago, uh, Tubitak uh, start, uh, we started a, a national project to build end-to-end -end 5G infrastructure so that uh, our local operators uh, do not have to uh, buy uh, equipment from uh, uh, overseas, but uh, uh, buy locally. So for the last three years, we've been developing end-to-end uh, -end, uh, 5G uh, infrastructure. Uh, together with uh, three mobile operators, Tutelecom, Turkcell, and Vodafone, uh, are also members of this uh, project. Uh, so, uh, because of it, uh, it is uh, uh, lengthened. Uh, so, uh, it will end uh, first quarter of uh, 2021. Whatever is needed for 5G, there will be a prototype uh, of of what is needed by the end of uh, first quarter in uh, 2021. Our expectation uh, is uh, uh, 5G licenses to be issued by uh, by the end of 2021 and uh, mobile operators start spending uh, early 2022. So uh, our local project will be ready to uh, satisfy uh, most of operators' uh, needs, obviously. Uh, operators will need many, many different combinations, and uh, it is uh, difficult to meet all of them. But uh, we are hoping that uh, we will uh, we will be covering fifty to seventy percent of the uh, investment uh, locally. Uh, these are the uh, areas that five uh, G. Uh, I mean, uh, this HTK members are uh, working on and. This is the kickoff meeting, uh, all the ministers and head of Tibetan uh, at the signing of this uh, project. Uh, this has been the largest uh, Tibetan project uh, so far in the in Turkish history. So hopefully it will be a, a successful one. Uh, so we are hoping, uh, as you can see here, we missed uh, 3G by nine years, uh, 4G by five years. Hopefully. We will catch uh, 5G in uh, in 2022. Uh, so 
similar to what 5G PPP did in Europe, as I uh, mentioned, uh, 5G PPP is public-private partnership. So it brings together uh, all the uh, all the players uh, that are a part of this uh, ecosystem. I, I'm sorry, this is in Turkish. Uh, I, I took this from the uh, organization's uh, website. Uh, but they, they uh, together with BTK, uh, the ICT uh, regulator in Turkey, uh, all the industry work together to develop uh, uh, a blue, uh, white book uh, that uh, that uh, uh, compiled what is how is 5G going to be uh, deployed in Turkey? What are the expectations of all the industries? What standards uh, should be used for uh, fi uh, Turkish 5G needs, and also uh, uh, an uh, academical uh, uh, PhD program was started, and uh, uh, a test bed, bed was uh, founded uh, as a result of this uh, study uh, in Ankara uh, between Bilkent. Uh, uh, Otu and uh, Hacettepe, there is a 5G test bed, uh, which is not active right now. Uh, and a similar one is planned uh, for Turkey, for people developing uh, 5G applications. Uh, they can try their applications on this test bed. Thanks, uh, thanks for listening. That's uh, hopefully uh, it's, uh, it gave you some insight into what's happening with 5G uh, globally and uh, in Turkey. Uh, Thank you for your presentation. It was very informative for us. Uh, there is some questions on YouTube. There is some questions on YouTube. Okay. I can ask them right now. Okay. Uh, is the current fiber optic network ready for 5G? I no, guess. Uh, no, it is. Uh, it is not ready. Probably we have uh, up to 15-20 uh, percent of what is needed for 5G. Unfortunately, there is a, a, a, a political as well as uh, economical uh, problem uh, resolving this. Uh, three operators are not uh, uh, uh, at the same level. Uh, obviously, Turkish Telecom is uh, also the uh, operator of the uh, fixed line network. So uh, the other two operators uh, cannot uh, uh, make their uh, fibers uh, as compatible as uh, as this fi uh, fixed uh, network, and uh, they are hoping for the government to uh, invest in 5G infrastructure. Uh, I mean, fiber infrastructure, rather than themselves uh, paying for it. So there is a uh, there is a game uh, uh, played there. Thank you. Any other question? Can Turkey's independence to global leaders like Huawei and Nokia create new security concerns? Well, I, uh, I don't know how, how you formed that uh, question. Uh, I mean, our dependency to Huawei or Nokia is a security concern. Uh, yes. I, uh, yes. Our, uh, if we can provide our own uh, technology, we will have independence and uh, less uh, security concern, obviously. Okay, thank you. Are there enough job opportunities for new graduates in the communication sector in Turkey? Uh, abundance. I mean, uh, I think uh, you, you did great uh, to choose uh, electrical engineering, uh, assuming uh, all the attendees are electrical engineers or uh, in the related uh, engineering disciplines. There are huge uh, amount of uh, opportunities in, in Turkey. 5G is a major uh, uh, upgrade uh, from uh, 4G network in terms of uh, the need for people and uh, uh, capabilities. Uh, 5G network uh, will be will require DevOps uh, capabilities. Our operators until 4G were not uh, set up for DevOps uh, uh, type uh, deployments. Like in, uh, I mean, I I usually sell to all these three operators, and if if I want to do more than one update a year, they will kill me. 
but their competitor right now, uh, Amazon is making 300 million upgrades a year. So uh, the operators uh, understood that to, to be able to take a market share back from the what we call OTTs. Uh, OTTs means apps uh, that, that do not invest in networks but make money from the networks. Uh, so uh, to compete with them, they will need uh, such agile networks and that uh, agility requires a huge uh, uh, workforce. Uh, so DevOps capability is very important. AI capability is very important. Uh, the networks will be, uh, we didn't discuss much about it, but uh, 5G networks require a lot of uh, uh, AI uh, ML type uh, knowledge. Uh, like uh, 5G antenna will be tracking people down uh, rather than uh, carpet bombing. Uh, uh, that that brings a lot of uh, uh, productivity, but requires a lot of uh, AI type knowledge. Thank you. Uh, how much time do we need for all people to benefit from 5G technology? Well, the, the worldwide uh, expectation for penetration uh, of 5G is uh, uh, about uh, 15 to 20 percent by 2024, which which is very low. Uh, it, it's, it's also because uh, many uh, countries, uh, and Turkey is one of them, we started uh, for 4G in 2016. Usually a new technology in uh, mobile technologies have a 10 years uh, timeline to take uh, the benefit of it. Uh, so that means 4G will be around uh, for a long time. In, uh, by 2025, more, more people will be using 4G than 5G. But after uh, 2025, uh, it, it will be mostly 5G. Thank you. There is one more question. What do you think about costs, costs of mobile plans in Turkey? Will we pay more for 5G data plans? I don't expect, uh, as I said uh, earlier, uh, I don't expect a huge difference. I mean, uh, probably... At the beginning, uh, you may pay 50% of what you're paying for the best uh, service. Uh, I mean, uh, you get the top of the line 4G, 4.5G service for, let's say, $100. Uh, 5G service would be most likely 150 at most at the beginning, but it will settle down to 100, uh, 100 to 110 uh, again. So it's not going to be a huge difference. Uh, otherwise, they will not be able to sell. And uh, what's the point of uh, investing in it? Thank you. That was the last question. Thank you for joining us today. It was a pleasure to have you this evening. Uh, I, I, I thank you very much. Uh, good luck to uh, all the uh, students. Uh, and uh, hope to see you uh, uh, doing work on uh, 5G. Uh, thank you. And goodbye. Nice. Uh, we will be back in a short break with our giveaway session. So see you in our giveaway session.
Bende sesiniz gelmiyor. Nasıl sesiniz gelmiyor? Ha, tamam. Şu Oldu. an açtın mı? <gülüyor> evet evet oldu tamam. Etkinlik yeri, yerine arkada ofis dizisini izlersen, o, yani Chrome sesini kapatırsan. Gelmiyor. Nasıl sesiniz gelmiyor? Ha, tamam. Şu an açtın. Kim yayını izliyor? Şeyden yansıyor. Ömer sesin kapıda. Evet Ömer. <gülüyor> Sesini aç. Aa, konuşuyorum ben de. Teşekkür falan ediyordum. <gülüyor> Öncelikle bütün e, katılan IEEE gönüllerine ve ekibime teşekkür ederim. Ben ekranımı paylaşayım da birkaç hediyemiz vardı. Ona bakalım. Şimdi öncelikle neyden başlayalım? Instagram'daki mi doldurduğumuz formlardan başlayalım sizce? Bence forumlardan başlayalım. Forumlardan başlayalım. Tamamdır. Bu forumlardan 6 tane vardı her oturumda. E, bunları sertifikasyonu kontrol etmek için ve e, her oturumda bir tane hediye dağıtmak için yaptık. E, dördüncü oturum hariç hepsinde komsokite vereceğiz. Dördüncü oturumda iki tane Süha Bey'in kitabını vereceğiz iki kişiye. Bakalım ben Excel dosyasını açayım. Random Org'dan ilk formu kaç kişi doldurmuş? 139 2 2'den 139'a kadar 80 80'de kim oluyor? Yağız Simav. O Eskişehir'e geldi ödül. <gülüyor> Haydi dedim kapatıyorum. Eski eski olarak ilk ödülümüzü aldık. Hadi devam. Ee, i̇kinci forumda kim var? 197'ye kadar var. 2'den 197. 42. Bir daha Yağız çıkarsa vermem ama. Aa olmaz Peki. öyle. Hayır. Senem, Senem İrgaş. Bu hangi okulda tanıyor musunuz? Tebrikler Senem. Bunu kaydedelim. Üçüncü. Kazananlar çette mi? Çette olanlar Her varsa. Çettelerse tepki versinler. 180. Bakayım. 102 bu da. 102'de kim var? Alp Güzel. <gülüyor> <gülüyor> Güzel şey moderatörlerin ödülü olsun. Alp'e de verdik. 4. E, bunu da 2 kişiye vereceğiz kitap. 136'ya kadar. Hemen. 2. 56. İkincisi 136. E, 136. Ali Öney. O da Nam Kemal de benim okulumdaydı. İkincisi de 56 mıydı? 56. Evet. 56. Umut gün doğdu. Ee, i̇kisine de tebrikler. Bakalım 5 ve 6 kaldı. Doğru. 176. Bu 8. Bakalım ilk kim olur. Murat Kerimoğlu. Tebrikler Murat. Murat da Tekirdağ Namık Kemal Üniversitesi'nde. Var mı chatte olup kazanan? Var var. Yağız'ı gördüm ben. Tamamdır. E, 153. 153 yazıyorum hemen. 137 çıktı. 137'de kim varmış? Emirhan Koçyiğit. Emin Han'a da tebrikler. Excel dosyasındakiler bittiyse Instagram'a bakalım. Evet tebrikler gördüm. Yağız falan var. Instagram içinse 
şeye bakalım kaç tane post var? 7 tane post var sanırım 7 8 tane. 3 kişiye tasarımlı kupa era cup creative'den de yazmışız. Onun için 3 asil 5 de yedek seçelim. 3 etiket bir de Şuradan de kopyalama yanlış olmaz. Ben gibi sorun yok herhalde. Atil ee, 5 yedek. Çekilişi kazanan arkadaşlar bize yazmasın. Ee, biz onlara ulaşacağız. 7 sayım. Bir de burada asil tahlili olarak kazanmanız kazandığınız anlamına gelmez. E, kayıt formunda doldurulmuş olmanız gerekiyor. Onu kontrol edeceğiz. <gülüyor> Aa, Ali Eren aldı. <gülüyor> Ali Eren Karadağ. Ali Eren. Melisa Ulu sanırım ikincisi. Üçüncüsü de Samet Kaya. Kupa kazanan arkadaşlar. Herhalde Komsok Deri'yi takip ediyorlardır. O Zert Moray da aldı. Buradan da Trakya Üniversitesi'ne selamlarımızı yolluyoruz. Çok uzun sürer mi bu takipçi kontrolü? Bakayım ben. Deniz senin için nasıl geçti? Zorlandığın bir taraf oldu mu moderatörlük yaparken? Ya sadece şey mesela bazı yerlerde nedensizce heyecanlandım. O zaman şey e, Türkçe düşünmeye başladım. Mesela İngilizce konuşurken önemli olan İngilizce düşünmek. Türkçe düşünmeye başladığınız zaman iş kopuyor orada. Ben de heyecanlandığım zaman öyle Türkçe'ye kaydığımda ne diyeceğimi de unuttum. Oralarda bir tek zorlandım ama onun dışında iyiydi yani. Çok zorlanmadım. Rahattı. Ya bir de bu arada hani şey, yüz yüze nasıl olur mu bilmiyorum ama online'ın atmosferi baya güzeldi yani benim için. Öyle Kupa derli hocalarla derli. Ya bir konuşturtmadın o zaman niye <gülüyor> soruyorsun? <gülüyor> Allah Allah. E, araya bir gireyim. Yerine gireceğim ben de. Çok tutmayayım insanlara. Bir dakika söylüyorum tamam. sen devam et. Kupa Yok, kazananlardan tamam. şey, zaten, takip söyleyeyim. ediyorlar. Atla. <gülüyor> Hadi devam et. Ulaşacağız biz. Onu diyecektim. Şimdi Deniz konuşuyor. Seni nasıl geçti? <gülüyor> tamam sen konuş hadi. Seni nasıl geçti? Ya iyiydi beklediğimden. Ya beklediğimden bayağı iyiydi. Dün bir teknik sıkıntı oldu. Orada bir şey yaptık. Ne yapacağımızı bilemedik ama onu da çözdük hemen yani. Evet telefondan falan bağlanmıştı. Orada arkada takım çalışmasıyla deniz slaytları geçti. <gülüyor> Orada bir kriz oldu evet ya. Ama iyiydi yani. Ya yüz yüze olsa çok daha güzel olurdu bence. Abi Mert'e de iki oldu. <gülüyor> Bak daha yedek tane. Yedek. Yavaş yavaş yukarı <gülüyor> çıkıyor ama. <gülüyor> Hemen bir takipçi kontrolü Bugün atalım. Şanssın kanka tebrik ederim. Ooo Mirza da aldı. Almadı almadı onu. Yedek. Yazık la. Çekti ee, olay mı kazanlardan ya? O sticker yazmışız. Onların hesaplarına da bakalım. Herhalde Ahmet ve Mustafa da sorun çıkmayacak gibi duruyor bakalım. Takipçileri çok da uzun sürüyor. Ben diğerine geçeyim. Aynen. Bitti galiba. Bu off sticker. İkiye verecektik. Dörtte yedek yazalım. Bana çıkarsa ben alacak mıyım şimdi? Buna izin var mı? 
<gülüyor> Alabilirsin canım. Niye alamayız? Sana çıktı sonuçta. Tamam ben canlı yayında. Yani. Canlı rastgele yayında. olarak. Tabii. Ben tablo istiyordum ya. Ben İnan de tablo istiyordum sanırım ama. Şu an ne çekiyoruz? Aa Şu kendimi gördüm. Aa gitti orada kendimi gördüm ya. Sticker çekiyoruz. Sticker. Beş kişiye. Pardon be, iki kişiye beş tane. Sıla güven Aynı sanırım. Aynı gördüm. Bir de Onur Hı. Pamukoğlu. İrem, Aa, İrem Yedek. <gülüyor> <gülüyor> Geçmiş olsun. O Eskişehir'den bir yediğimiz daha var. Diğer sekmeden ben çekebiliyor muyum takipçi kontrolü yaparken? Şimdi ney? Tabloyu mu çekelim? Evet. evet. Kişiye tablo. Bir gidip geldim Türkçe'ye dönmüş demiş Murat. <gülüyor> <gülüyor> Aa Onur Aa. ne oldu? Onur mu patladı? Evet. evet. Aa İrem de takip etmiş. İrem. İrem'den de gitmiş. İpeğe kalmış. <gülüyor> Tebrikler İpek. <gülüyor> İrem'den de çekmiş. <gülüyor> Tamamdır. Bunu da kapatalım. Hangi tiyor? Tablo. Tablo kafeyi takip etmek gerekiyordu sanırım. İki dedim. Üç değil miydi? Daha şey yapalım. Aynen. Üç. Beş tane de yedek yapalım. Daha. Geri sayımı seçmemişiz. Beyza 38. Kripto Umutcan. Sena tek baş sanırım bir de. Bakalım takip etmişler mi acaba? Sizce nasıl geçti? Yorumlardan feedback verebilecek olan var mı? Beğenmediğiniz bir taraf daha iyi olabilirdi böyle işlese. Saat olur, bir şey olur. Konuşmacıların sıklığı çok olmasa, az olmasa. Şey gelirse yorumlardan bakar mısınız? Deniz zaten bakamıyorum da. Tamam, yorumları çekeriz direkt. Boş da yapabilirsiniz bu arada. <gülüyor> Sadece soru falan değil. Gözükmesini istediğiniz <gülüyor> evet. şey Çıkmak istiyorum. Selam gönderebilirsiniz okulunda. Bitto <gülüyor> kaybetmiş. Beyza. Umutcan şansına harcadın evet. <gülüyor> <gülüyor> Sana çıksa senden satın alırdı muhtemelen. Aa Sena da şansını kaybetmiş sanırım. Samet ve Almira. Samet kazanmış. Tebrikler Samet. Verilen aralar kısaymış. Öyle bir feedback. Verilen aralar yapmış. kısa. Evet olabilir. Değerlendiririz onu da. <gülüyor> Almira da kazanmamış sanırım. Ee, Asuman Girit. Tebrikler. Bakayım tekrar. Bu arada şeyi sorusu geldi. Sivit satın aldık ama kazanırsak ne olacak? Kazanırsanız ikincisini de yollarız veya şey yaparız. Ödediğiniz parayı geri veririz. Sivit formunu da atabilirsiniz biriniz linke isterseniz. <gülüyor> Moderatörlerden biri. Kodlap'tan kitap mı yazmışım? 4 asil 8 de yedek olsun. Böyle kodlap yayın yapalım.
Gitmişler daha bitmedi ya. Evet evet daha bitmedi. <gülüyor> Irmak Koç, Almira Gürkan sanırım. Lan bir an ben çıktım sandım. <gülüyor> <gülüyor> Çok fazla bekledim orada. <gülüyor> Başka chatten gelen feedback var mı? Yine ben artık herkes kazanıyor diyen var. <gülüyor> ben kendimi görmedim ki zaten. Ben de kendimi görmedim ya. Galiba. <gülüyor> Huawei'den gelen çok hızlı konuşmuş diye bir feedback var. Galiba biraz hızlı konuşuyor. Yani. Biraz, evet biraz hızlı konuştu da evet. böyle bir şey anı da oldu orada. Nasıl diyelim bilgisayarda bir sıkıntı çıktı telefondan. Evet, problemler yaşadık. O yüzden de biraz aceleye geldi onun şeyi başlangıcı. Bu kontrol edilirken ben de diğerine geçeyim. Diğeri neydi bundan sonraki? Sweet short. Ee, i̇ki kişiye Placebo'dan sweet short, dört kişiye de 40 liralık hediye çeke. Ee, bunu altı yaparız, ilk ikisi hediye kazanır. Yedekte 10 olsun. Bu sonuçlandı mı? Irmak kazanamamış sanırım. Her seferinde şu fake yiyorum. <gülüyor> Bu da yapıla dursun. Şeyi çekelim biz. Şu switch şeyi. Komsok kitini. Bu uzun sürecek. Bunu 10 kişiye vereceğiz. Açıklamada belirttiğim gibi 5 kişiye şeyden verecektik. Forumlardan. Onları kimin kazandığını söyledik. 10 yazacağım buraya. On asil, on beşte yedek. Şimdi takip etmeye gerek yok. Ee, bu Herkes. hangisiydi bu? Ee, Kitaplı sanırım. Evet, bunlar gitmiş. Berkay Yılmaz, e, Abdullah sanırım. DJ Akgün ve Talha. Tebrikler. Bir de switch shirt kaldı sanırım son olarak. Yanlış yapmadıysam. Evet en son bir daha tekrar gösteririm. Biraz karıştı. Tamam, Kimde tamam, kadar? Gösteririm. Sweet short. Kelsil 3 yedek. Seçeriz. En son tekrar şey yaparım. Zaten Instagram sayfamızda da paylaşırız yayın kapandıktan sonra. Kontrollerini gerçekleştirdikten sonra formla. Ee, bunlar da sorgulansın. Evet bu bitti sanırım. Ee, Berk ve 
Seni okuyamadığım arkadaş sivit kazandı. Dört arkadaş da kırk kralık hediye çeke. Kazanmış olacak muhtemelen. Burada da konsol kit vereceğimiz arkadaşlar. Sivit short. Batuhan Başkır Tekirdağ Namıkan Üniversitesi Başkanı'ydı. Kazandı muhtemelen. İlki okuyamadım ismini. Cümle. Cümle sen kazanmışsın. 40 liralık hediye çekti. <gülüyor> İlk defa çekiliş kazandı. <gülüyor> Batuhan ve Diğer arkadaş da sivit kazandığı için tebrik ediyoruz. Bakalım en son komsol kit kaldı. 10'a 15 yedek. Çete ben bir daha bakayım. Garibanın yüzü gülür mü? <gülüyor> Yedek çıkanlara bir şey bilmiyor. Üzücü. <gülüyor> <gülüyor> ben adımı bile göremedim hiç ya. Ben de yorum attım. Takipçi ben kontrol. Ben geçerken kontrol gördüm için. kendimi birkaç kere. <gülüyor> ha sanırım ben yapılmamıştım. Başlatılmamış. Kazandı sandım etsin. Katılımcıların iletişim bilgilerini toplu bir şekilde paylaşabilir misiniz? Kim diyor onu? Benim Yorum. su özden. Yani maalesef <gülüyor> katılımcıların iletişim bilgilerini paylaşamayız. Katılımcıların derken konuşmacılardan mı? <gülüyor> Ha, tamam konuşmacılarla paylaşırız ya. tabii ki. Evet, evet. Konuşmacılarla kendi paylaşırız. Katılımcı derken ben izleyen insanların sandım. <gülüyor> ee, İsa'nın güncesi hariç diğer arkadaşlar kazandı. Bunların tekrar şey kontrolünü yaptıktan sonra formu dolur, doldurmadığını ona göre Instagram'da bir saat içinde duyurmuş oluruz. Bunun dışında paylaşmayı durdurayım. Ee, katılan herkese çok teşekkür ederim. Ee, ekibime de bu güzel etkinliği çıkarmak için yardımlarından dolayı teşekkür ederim. Herhangi bir başka sorusu olan yoksa iyi akşamlar deyip kapatalım. Tamamdır. Bizi sosyal medya hesaplarımızdan takip etmeyi unutmayın. Tekrardan görüşürüz. İyi akşamlar. İyi akşamlar. Bir falan bir şey yapın ya. Şöyle. Ekipçe. <gülüyor> Ömer screenshot falan al. Aldım, aldım. Ben aldım birkaç tane. İyi akşamlar <gülüyor> tekrar.